Hey, everybody. Good evening and welcome to another show here on the Comic Guy Live channel. Tonight, we're going to be talking to both Chuck Costas and Dave Mandel about the upcoming prop store auction in L.A. So uh, lots of exciting stuff there going on. I mean, they've got a lot of art and some pretty impressive uh, props as well. So we're going to just get this thing rolling and bring both Chuck and David into the show. Good evening, gentlemen. How are you? Hey, good evening. Bill. How are you? We're doing good. Fantastic. I'm glad, uh, you know, I don't get to share the, the screen with uh, you guys too often. So uh, I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time tonight to hang out with me. Come, come uh, it's, out to it's the West not, Coast more often. I was going to say, it's not just you, Bill. I mean, I haven't seen Chuck in a good 14 hours. So this was really a chance <laughs> for me and Chuck to spend some more quality time together. So, yeah. Dave, how did you great. wake up yeah. this morning? It was, it was, <laughs> missing was you, practice? Chuck. Just missing you. Wondering yeah. when would I see you again, if I would see you again. And here you are. So good. Yeah. <laughs> Same as yesterday. Well, I, so I take it you guys were working late last evening at the uh, prop store offices? Uh you could put working in quotes. We were fucking around with art, which is what <laughs> good good collectors should be doing. We were looking at stuff and taking pictures and talking about, oh, what if I could find one of these? And would you give up that for this and that? And, you know, just a good old fashioned art discussion. It was, uh, yeah, just but went late into the night. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we spend our time. Just, you know. Well, it sounds like, in, you know, whenever uh, collectors get together, that's the, those topics that kind of come up all the time, right? You know, yeah. Which, what would you let go for that piece? And, and uh, you know, would you uh, be willing to, uh, you know, risk it all for that one other piece, right? I mean, it happens in our hobby. I mean, I, there's there's things, I think, in every auction that I see where I, I, I ask myself that same question. I usually end up backing down, but it's fun to ponder it, right? I mean, it's, it's it, the thing is, we've had a, the last four or five years, we've really had a, uh, it's been a boom for art collectors and art sellers at the end of the day. There's just been so much great stuff on the market that, uh it's a it, it's a bit overwhelming, but fun. I mean, the things that we've been able to see and and the things that have changed hands and gone into new collections has been pretty fantastic the last several years. And prop story, you know, you know, thanks to you, Chuck, I think has uh, brought a lot of those pieces to market. So, um, so tonight's gonna be fun looking at the the lots that you guys have selected for us. Yeah, I mean, I always look at you know, it's funny. I, we have seventeen hundred items in this auction, and it's fun to take the lens of saying actually, what artwork do we have in there? Uh, because mm -hmm. it sometimes does get lost in the enormity of these auctions. And as Dave and I were talking last night, it's like the auctions just keep coming and coming and coming. And and they're all different types. And I think as a collector, you you, you know, there is obviously comic art auctions that are just focused on comic art. There's a, a prop store auction like ours. It's got a selection of anything from, you know, I guess, movie artwork to comic artwork to movie props and other things like that. Um, they're just all over the place. And I think as collectors, I always say, too, that we don't always not always linear i mean i think we, a lot of us here are focused on comic art but there's always other things that we're we are uh, intrigued by and as as i look at this selection as we go through some of this maybe other folks will be as intrigued as i am it's nice to sometimes step away from the pure comic art and appreciate some of the other artwork that is out there that you would still you know want to decorate your walls but also brings back memories in in, in different ways mm-hmm yeah i was gonna say you know uh and obviously i am now a pretty hardcore prop collector movie prop collector costume collector on top of my comic art collection but certainly in my early days of movie prop collecting the easy sort of transition if you will was starting to look at um movie production post-production pre-production poster art that kind of stuff it was a very natural transition into looking at hand-drawn storyboards hand-drawn set designs hand-drawn you know movie poster movie poster prelims alternate designs for movie posters whatever that was but the sort of art to art was a very natural transition into the prop world and i love when a new catalog comes out to just sort of sometimes look not only at the props that I like, but also to still keep an eye on what's going on art wise. So that's always very fun. Dave, would you, uh, did you start out collecting art first or was it the props first? Cause I know you're comic familiar. art first, comic art oh, right. first. Yeah. Comic feeling, art but, first. Yeah. Was it, is that because it was more accessible back at the time when you were starting your collector travels? I mean, I guess it was what I certainly encountered first. I mean, I guess, you know, it's a funny thing where I didn't necessarily, I collected comics for a very long time without knowing you could even get comic art. It just, I was not aware. And by the way, that includes, and I may have told this story on your show the last time I was on, that includes shopping at 
Pete Koch's store, Big Apple Comics, which was on 92nd and Broadway, uh, across from where my grandmother lived, and literally was, I think, in that store where behind the wall where I couldn't see, I think Pete was back there with like Albert Moy and Scott Dunbeer with like comic art. And I was out front with no idea they existed or comic art even existed and was buying comics for years. It wasn't really, wasn't until sort of my end of time in New York city where I started, where the shows were coming to, through New York again. And I saw a little bit of comic art at shows and then eventually saw comic art when I moved to Los Angeles, uh, when I went to my first San Diego. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know what I was, I just had blinders on and was sort of missing it, but yes, I encountered comic art first. Uh, so I guess it was my, my first, a, a true addiction. And how does that uh, way you know measure out today? I mean, is it still pretty evenly divided between uh, the props and your uh, passion for comic art? I mean, I still have way more comic art than I have props. I think just because of when I got into it, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. just I when I when I started buying comic art, it was so ridiculously reasonably priced that it was very easy to build a very large collection without thinking twice about it. Even when I finally got into movie props, while it was perhaps a little cheaper than it is now, it still wasn't cheap, cheap, you know, in that sort of same way. I mean, you know, I, I see you know, every now and then I pull something out of my collection where I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know, this is a Miller daredevil cover and I can kind of go and I, and I, and for a fact, I know, you know, it was $1,200 or this was $2,000. And I know that seems hard to think about, but it was true. Do you know what I mean? Or oh, yeah. this Dark Knight page was 700 or 750 and then it was 12, you know, and, it, and so the price progressions are still in my head, unfortunately, which makes current pricing much, much worse. But it's a much, it's a huge differential as to where I started and where it is now. And my, I guess, prop differential is not quite as large. It, 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 it started pretty healthy. And yes, it's more expensive now, but it wasn't quite as cheap, I, I mm -hmm. guess is the easiest way of putting it. So like, you know, everything else, all these collectibles have, you know, kind of gone crazy over the last couple of years. But I at least was in comic art once upon a time, at least. So, Yeah. <laughs> But I, I actually blame Dave for getting me into movie props because when I came out to LA, I, I thought you were about to. I thought you were about to blame me for the price of comic art, and I was like, "Let's save that for the. Let's save that for the audience." Yeah, yeah. I was um, going to say that's coming on. If you look on the right hand side, you'll see the comments. And I'm sure there's a lot of expletives, but um, no, I actually blame Dave for getting me into movie props because I'd go over to his house late at night, and of course we would talk about comic art, and then he'd always be like, "Hey, isn't this cool? I got a stormtrooper helmet. You know, you could have one too, and maybe you think this is really cool as one day as." well um and you know i think it grew on me a little bit and i think being in los angeles here you're you're more subjected to it than maybe some other parts of the country and sort of see that but <laughs> the thing that you also start to realize being here in los angeles is that there's a whole there's a whole group of like comic artists that have be gone on to become you know storyboard artists or design concept artists for some of these films and there's no there's a, a tremendous amount of crossover and and i think you are right especially before places like prop store existed and prop auctions existed being in LA you could find props just occasionally sometimes in actual stores they pop up in comic book stores you'd be in a comic book store and they might have a movie prop just on the wall because one of their customers or somebody an artist who does comics came into the store and you know gave it to them or sold it to them for you know so you by being in Los Angeles you would see props which i think is not quite as true with the rest of the United States of America. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Chuck, do you, uh, you, have you collected a few movie props yourself? What do you, what do you have around the house? I don't, we, I don't believe we talked about that. When we got uh, what do I have? Around? It's all GI mean, Joe. It's it, all I just am, I you have the largest GI Joe. The worse the GI Joe movies get, the more he collects it. <laughs> Is there a new one coming out, Dave? Is yeah, there? it's going to be really <laughs> awful. I Is can't it? wait. Um, I do have a large GI Joe collection of movie props, but, um, and, and yes, I do have what you would think a snake eye sword and some of those things, you know, the things that you'd want. But, um, I guess, you know, Dave actually had some really good advice to me as I got into movie props versus comic art. And I think that the first advice is 
before you start doing this, make your list of what you want. Um, because it's very easy, you know, when we all got into comic art, I, at least, at least when I got into comic art, it was buy what you can find because you go to various conventions and things would pop up and it was relatively affordable and everybody, you know, at least in the eighties, in nineties was ending up with a stack of stuff and some of the stuff you've kept long-term and some of the stuff you've traded over the years. But with movie props, even when I started getting into it, and that was probably seven, eight, maybe 10 years ago that I really started buying this stuff. Um, it had started getting a little bit more expensive, but not quite where comic art was. And so I think that, you know, I made my list of, okay, I want an Indiana Jones whip. I want, you know, uh, GI Joe. I want to just buy every single piece of GI Joe props out there. Um, but you, you make your list of back to the future. What are your favorite movies? And you think of the prop that if it were to come along, what would I go for? And keeping that type of focus in collecting, whether it be comic art or props or whatever you're into, um, does end up yeah, I guess keeping you without a, a giant pile of stuff that you ultimately need to get rid of someday. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that's, that was a great advice that Dave gave me. So thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Yeah. Although I, thought, I, thought, I thought I was pretty right. clear about don't get anything from GI Joe, but I thought no, I, you said that. That no, I, I, like. I still oh. have not gotten my transformers piece <laughs> that I love, but you know, I knew Dave would make more fun of that. So uh, I think Jason, uh, yeah, we, I, we, I know we have a lot of stuff to look at tonight, but we might as well take yeah. some, a few questions here. I, I saw Jason asked if a movie fails or doesn't do well, does it lower the price of, you know, the value of the props? Or Absolutely. Is it more of a, yeah, it does. It hurt. It affects. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two things. If a movie comes out that nobody, you know, that flops in the box office, it is probably not a huge amount of collector value, uh, such as G.I. Mm. Joe. Um, but I think if like, let's say Indiana Jones, I think there's always it, it, it. I guess it can depend, right? Like the classic Indiana Jones, the first three movies, um, even though the last couple haven't been as as good as you would have hoped, it necessarily hasn't killed it. Um, but I do think what you are starting to see over time is, you know, especially for, you know, Star Wars, some of these other properties, you start just getting numb to it. Um, and, you know, if the quality isn't necessarily there, you may still focus in on what you love, those particular early movies, but you're not necessarily going to buy into the whole franchise and buy everything that's coming along. Um, and I, I guess, Dave, maybe you've got some examples where it it actually has killed maybe some some franchises. Uh, um, it's, you know, it's interesting because even when something sometimes, you know, bombs, whatever that is, you know, you get these sort of you get things, you know, often become sort of cult hits. So. Chuck and I were just talking about the fact in this auction, I don't know if we called it out, so forgive me for jumping around and going out of order, but we were just talking about the fact that there's a, a, a glaive from, uh, did I call that out or maybe it's on my I, list? I see Bob has got that yeah. over there too, yeah. Um, so uh, there's a glaive from the Kroll movie. Uh, and yeah, you know, exactly, Bob. Kroll was a major flop. No one should bid on that glaive. It's already at like like forty thousand dollars, isn't it? Or something no, it's like like, well, it's oh. like twenty seven five. Twenty seven five. So the next yeah. bid is thirty, and I, I I want that thing so badly, but I just can't even imagine spending that kind of money on a glaive. It's <laughs> it's it's it's, ins, it's insane, um, but you know it's a cult hit, and yet here we all are, and we're all whatever we are, you know, fifty odd years old. And we can't get that out of our heads. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's just like, oh, got to get the glaive, got to get the glaive. You know, my son could care less about it, but here we all are, got to get the glaive. Um, and so, you know, sometimes every, you know, every rule sort of kind of gets broken. I'm not sure there are perfect rules. I do think when a new movie comes out, if it doesn't hit, and there is an auction of that movie stuff, there are probably bargains to be had. But by the way, the disastrous movie that comes out in 10 years, you know, goes on cable or goes on to streaming and becomes a cult hit. And then who knows? So I don't know. There's no great answer. I think the larger answer is if you're, you, again, it kind of goes back to, you got to buy what you love and not being worried about the market. You know, that's, I think that's the larger issue because you could just chase, like if you're only buying stuff that from disastrous movies, I, again, I'm just not, you know, buy what you want, but I guess there's an answer. So. Well, there you have it, everybody. And uh, Madam Web keeps coming up because I guess uh, I, I haven't seen it, but uh, they're they're curious. You know, what I can tell you, Tony has not contacted me about that one quite yet, but I, I don't know if we will be doing a dedicated Madam Web. There may be some stuff that gets out there. Sure. I have not, I have not seen it, um, 
but yeah. I mean, how, I, how soon after a film is uh, you know done with its run at the box office do uh, the props typically um, get to you know? At least I think with, with Madam Web, they were trying to move that stuff Saturday morning. I think like uh, right after opening day, they were calling around trying to get rid of the stuff. Um, I'm not sure the Madam Web uh, questions are real, but I'm just going to say that I don't I don't know this audience, but I don't but think they're, they're really real. Quite I don't think those are real comments. But anyway, like, okay, for, yeah, they're not a quote real quote, but but it, but it does actually apply. Uh, you know, the, fair the, enough, the, fair the enough. The thought about uh, you know whether or not a, a film is successful if it has any bearing on things, but also like how quick it, after market because I've seen sometimes with uh, with the prop store auctions that, that a film will actually uh, you know get it get some of their props into your auctions within you know, a, with less than a year. Yeah. So, and then these other pieces that we see that are, I guess, are more prevalent, maybe those are coming out of collector's hands and not really coming out from the studios. And that, that might be how the churn works. I, I'm not very sure. Yeah, I mean, I'll give, I'll give you the quick answer. I think television is quicker to come to market because there's a, there's a point at which you know that that show is ending. And usually we can work with the studios as it's ending. Like with, when we did Better Call Saul, we knew that was ending. We went at the end, it, actually while they were filming the, the final season, we picked out all the things from all the previous seasons and we had it ready to go so that we could time it with the end of the show. With a movie, they typically want to hold it in case there is going to be a sequel on there, just in case they want to re... They don't necessarily always reuse things, but they like to have them and or they like to use them as reference if they're going to have a second movie out there. So with these some of these larger franchises, it does take a while before they're ready to part with the props um so you don't see it necessarily happening if they know it's going to be a one once and done movie you might see those things hit the market but things like dune where they know they're going to be doing three movies and they might reuse some of the props across those movies you're not necessarily going to see those things hit the market anytime soon mm -hmm. so uh so typically in a prop store auction i mean what's the percentage of uh pieces that are consigned by collectors or uh, you know, or maybe people who were in the film in some way versus ones that are being brought to you by a studio. Yeah, I think an auction like the one that we're going to talk about today, which is more of a vintage auction and has more of a selection across different uh, franchises and films and television shows. Um, most of that is probably coming from the collectors or people that were involved with the films, or it could have been the artists themselves that may have come mm -hmm. in. And for but instance, not from the studio. Usually, yeah, not necessarily. Not, we do have some stuff. Yes, usually yeah. a smaller amount of yeah. that kind of stuff. There, there might be a smaller amount of stuff, and and they may not. You know, we may not be able to just like anybody else reveal who the actual consigner is unless they right. want it to say it's coming from this. And sometimes it'll actually go to charity as well. Um, but yeah, I would say the majority of it's coming from vintage either collectors or people that have had it and it worked on these things or the families of people that inherited these types of things. So for instance, in this auction, we've got the Matthew Yurisich, um art collection and that's coming, you know, that, that that's coming from the family and they're sort of releasing that out as part of his legacy. So. Very nice. Well, so uh, would you like to dive in and start looking at some of the ones? Let's do it. So we're, we're going to start off. with with artwork, but this is, I guess, movie related. And I think we're going to today we're going to give everybody a, a tour of a whole bunch of different types of art that you're going to see, especially in a prop store auction here and this specific one. And uh, of when, again, thinking of like top movies, I am a big fan of Back to the Future. I'm lucky to own a hoverboard um, and I, I do not own a DeLorean itself. But I guess this is the closest thing that I probably would want to own an actual DeLorean, because if you've ever driven a DeLorean, they are horrible. They are the, the heaviest cars. They do not have power steering. They are just, and especially if they've been tricked out like a DeLorean uh, for Back to the Future, they've got all this stuff inside. Very hard to drive. Uh, but that being said, this is a design by Ron Cobb. Uh, Ron was, and Dave, maybe you want to give a little bit of history of Ron Cobb. Ron Cobb was sort of one of the premier, I guess, really movie conceptualists, uh, of, especially of the 70s. He kind of rose up in the 60s doing a lot of uh, editorial cartooning. And there are some wonderful books of his editorial cartooning. And uh, for a while, some of his cartoons were showing up on eBay quite regularly. Um, very Nixon, Vietnam heavy, and really, really gorgeous work. He made his move into sort of movie production work, uh, did a lot of aliens for Star Wars, then did work on the Alien and Aliens, uh, that franchise. He's all over Conan the Barbarian. So yeah. in a lot of, you know, all sorts of different sword and sorcery, sci-fi, and then the Back to the Future DeLorean 
uh, there's this piece and there's a second piece, which is kind of an interior cockpit drawing is the, the, the next lot. And these are all coming from the Cobb family. They've been slowly sort of selling some of his art off over the last couple of years. There's the cockpit. Um, and he just had a, just a really wonderful ability, whether it was, you know, like a, like a crazy, like hammerhead in star Wars or this sort of, you know, part DeLorean part future time machine, just a, just a wonderful ability to sort of bring things to life. And what's really fascinating about a lot of his drawings is you're looking at stuff. And then when you look at what they put on the screen, it's, I'm not going to say it's a perfect, perfect match, but unlike a lot of conceptual drawings where you see stuff and then it kind of very much changes, uh, his, in this case, back to the future stuff is very on point and really very much is, you know, what you saw is what they built, uh, which, uh, really speaks to Cobb's talent, uh, and just, uh, just, a phenomenal talent and uh, someone uh, who just put it up there number one marvel fan uh, yes just mentioned there's an art of ron cobb book that came out i think about a year ago uh and uh a really wonderful book doesn't have everything in it obviously nothing can but uh but just a really really nice book um and like i said the collections of his older uh uh, uh, editorial cartoons are available as well. I think they, on the Cobb site, they sell them. I think Stuart Ng always has them too. You can buy them. So, uh, I, I'm just a big fan for sort of almost all of his crossover work. The fact that he worked in so many genres, Star Wars to Back to the Future and all that kind of stuff. But I just think these are just gorgeous, both these pieces. So yeah, this is the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. You no, know, and I think it's, I think it's interesting, as you said, you, you sort of see that a lot of this stuff is very similar to what you see, but there are some differences in, in the design here. It almost seems like he designed a single, a single uh, seated DeLorean here where there's a lot of stuff on the right, the, yeah, on the right side. And obviously the middle panel does look a little different. And it's interesting if you zoom in, you can see the date Friday, November, it's actually November, although they changed the date. I think it's November 3rd, 1955 that he's going back to. So he even tried to incorporate some of that. And, and, you know, I think you do see a lot of this on the interior of it, although maybe in some slightly different configuration. Um, but they did follow this to to a good degree. And I think on the other one that you had, which is the exterior, you see that they were originally playing around with this idea of a, a sort of a single exhaust versus a double exhaust on the back. And so he's trying to figure mm -hmm. out, you know, what is this all about? But a lot of the detail that you, you want to see there. Um, on this. And so these, as Don or Dave alluded to, we, uh, Prop Store has been lucky to have a few uh, Back to the Future drawings. And it's been probably four years or so, four or five years. And I think we, we did it at the um, that LA show that we had sponsored a number of years ago. We had some of those drawings. But these are some of the best ones that I've ever seen. And I think for a Back to the Future fan, I'll actually show them, I'll show the size of these things too, which is also pretty incredible. So this is the the one that you were just showing there. So it's it's pretty huge. Um, would look pretty impressive on there. And then you've got the interior cockpit piece, piece that's right here as well. So they, they frame up really nicely. Um, and then if you put a, a nice prop next to it, I always I always find those those to complement each other really nicely. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's two great I never there. thought they would have been that large. That's uh, that's great. Yeah, and he worked yeah. on graph paper. Um, pretty typical of what I've seen for what he's done with Conan and, and Alien. Some of these things are very large, so that they can they can figure out what the scale is by having it on graph paper. Though, that's fantastic. So I assume you have uh, some cob in your collection, right, David? Uh, I do. I have. Uh, interestingly enough. Uh, the the we were talking i mentioned hammerhead it was actually you know the 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 hammerhead design was actually something he even was working on before star wars for something of his own uh and then when star wars kind of came about and he needed creatures he kind of grabbed hammerhead from his previous work so i have an example of his drawing of hammerhead in my collection but he's kind of wearing clothing and kind of sitting at a table at a restaurant kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of from the pre star Wars iteration of it, which I kind of get a kick out of even more. He kind of almost like a, the way Dave Cockrum used to like pull from his own I sketchbook on Dave different Cockrum. projects. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it kind of worked like that where it was just like, Oh, you need aliens. Well, I've got these six other cool aliens. Great. Let's do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's uh that's very cool. Very, very cool. Yeah, the so, other thing uh, I was sorry, I was just going to throw this out because someone was sort of talking about uh, uh, 
someone who said it there about uh, drafting class is now computers only. Uh, Marcus said that. And I was just going to say, there's a thing that kind of goes on in movie art right now. And I don't know, it strikes me. And again, I have not, I, I'm just watching, you know, movies. I'm just a fan, but it sometimes it just seems like all aliens look alike and all certain, like all spaceships look alike. There's a real similarity, like as if, as if there's only one design for some reason, I you know, there's like that just, I don't know, like they've all gotten very thin and tall and gray and I don't know, like something. <laughs> and what was fascinating about Cobb was he really was just drawing something very different. They were just like, they were like weirdo aliens and even like his Conan stuff. It's, it's, it's a little weird. I, I know that's a, a funny word to, to describe art with, but it really gives it all its own very unique feel. I don't know. I, that's what I, he doesn't draw like anybody else. And that's, I don't know what I appreciate. It's got a Dungeons yeah. and Dragons feel to it to me for whatever reason as well. No, it's almost like it's part. Yeah. It's almost like with the, when you look at some of the Dungeons and Dragons art where it's like, it almost seems part fanzine and part professional. And I kind of love that about Cobb. Like there's a, there's a little bit of a crudeness to his style, but also like, like what if he had big horns? Like he goes for that as opposed to this is how everyone else draws. I should draw like that. Anyway, one man's opinion. So take it as you will. Moving on. Sorry. Moving on to a different artist, David Mack. So this is a, an example where, I actually probably I, I actually searched this out not knowing who the artist was on Captain America at the time. And, and of course, it turned out to be David Mack. And I, I became familiar with David Mack um, through his Jessica Jones artwork. He I, we had prop store had done the Jessica Jones auction. Um, for those that know the show, uh, there was a, an artist on there named Oscar Oro Orocho. Uh, and it was actually David Mack's art. And David did the opening sequence for Je the Jessica Jones series but also then um, did the paintings that Oscar had done. And so you actually see his artwork throughout season two of Jessica Jones. But this is in stark contrast. And I think I, I call that his typical style. When you see a Jessica Jones comic book cover, looks very much like some of the things that you may have seen there, at least a, very, a different Very variation. painterly is what yeah. David Mack's sort of normal style is. Yeah. Yeah. A lot I would of never have thought this was David Mack. You know, but then, me. but this, this looks, you know, nothing like that style of David Mack, which is why I wouldn't, you know, I didn't really, really notice it until I did some studying and said, oh, this is David Mack that did this. Um, and it turns out David had actually pitched Marvel on the idea of doing this for the second Captain America movie. So they, they were looking to do the end sequence. And he pitched this idea of doing it more in a Steranko style, a very stark black and, and you know, sort of black and white images, although this one's black, white and red. And he played around with a lot of different versions of this. This Captain America and the Winter Soldier that we have in the auction are very similar to the ones that ended up in the final end sequence. Uh, but even with that, they had to play around with different designs because Cap's costume, as he was designing it, had changed. They were sort of evolving that at the same time. So every time that they changed his actual costume design, he had to change the way that he was drawing Captain America here as well. Um, so... What I like about these two, again, very sort of larger pieces that you, that are very striking, um, but you know, sort of represent the two main characters in the film, uh, and I, I I just like them. I like you know I like the the graphic nature of these pieces, and um, you know I do have a Jessica Jones piece in my in my collection from David. I think he's a great artist, and he's been contributing to the uh, Marvel Universe of Superheroes exhibit, which is now for folks that that are going to, to Basel, Switzerland. You can come visit it over there. Um, but you know, great to have these in the auction uh, to represent David's work, but also uh, one of the better Captain America films out there, Captain America and Winter Soldier. Well, very true. So, yeah. are, are you going to make it to Switzerland? Uh, I will make it to Switzerland. I will be heading out there right after we're done with this auction. I will be uh, sort of getting on a plane and going to the premiere of that. I believe that's on uh, the twentieth or twenty-first. I believe is when is when that's opening up. I mean, it's a weeks glad to away. have more of my stuff going over there and 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 finally getting to an international audience although they open the for those that know that they, they opened the new zealand exhibit not too long ago but that was mm -hmm. a completely different exhibit this is actually the u.s exhibit for those that were in columbus or philadelphia or uh you know some of the other places in the u.s this is the traveling exhibit that was in the u.s although it's changed the artwork has changed based on the people that have uh lent stuff to the exhibit over the years dave was was one of the first people um, that was involved in, in lending to the show, and it's just continued to evolve over time. Uh, this first in and first to leave. <laughs> <laughs> first to go, what? You're going to Detroit and 
whatever, like Ohio, not to Paris and Tokyo as originally promised, I'll take my stuff back. <laughs> yeah. I call him CFO Dave. <laughs> I, I get it. I, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, I don't know. I enjoyed the show a lot. I, I saw it in Columbus. Um, I didn't get to see it in the first I think couple. It's a, I think it's a fine show. And I think Columbus yep. is a fine city that I don't want to visit. I would like to go. I would like, to, I would like a free trip to France or, you know, not Ohio. Nothing against Ohio. I understand. Well, that, Switzerland sounds fun. Yeah. I think uh, that would have been a, a good trip to go on. But um, New Zealand's a bit far. But uh, it might have been It was. Fun. And I would recommend not going during Christmas time because nothing is open during <laughs> Christmas time. But that's, <laughs> that's, that was my fault for not doing my research before I, I got to New Zealand. But anyway, and hoping hey. to enjoy myself. I have been to Basel, Switzerland before. I used to work, I used to work with Novartis there. So. Uh, hmm. I know what to expect, I think. A lot of chocolate, little shops and all that. So. Anyway, we're talking art, Bill. We're talking, we talking art. art. And we're, we're talking comic art right now. We're talking comic art. So these, so here I wanted to um, you know, mix in some traditional comic book artwork into the auction here. And uh, you know, X-Men being one of my favorites, I wanted to have a selection of different X-Men artists. So uh, search some of these out. So this is our Silvestri example. Uh, I thought it was a really nice example with Jubilee and Psylocke, and you got a Wolverine being pulled through the, the I guess the, the the wall there. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it, for me. I was a little it, Sylvester was a little later than when I was reading. I guess I was reading the, the sort of him sort of the tail end of when I was actually reading the X Men. But I was thinking about it last night. It's, to me, Sylvester was a great bridge between John Romita Jr. and what you saw with Jim Lee. And I guess for you know people slightly younger than myself, he was you know one of the first guys that made an impression on them. So I thought this was a great page. Hopefully somebody out there will appreciate it and take it home. Well, there's uh, there's quite a few X Men fans out there and Sylvester fans as well. I mean, this is like where many uh, current readers got their start, right? The John Romina Jr. to Sylvester, they skipped over Cockrum and and uh, Burn and whatnot just because they're younger than all of us but uh but no this is nice i've got a few Sylvester examples in my collection pretty happy to have them yeah that was a nice one that was a nice one someone's asking what issue is this it's issue 261 uh Sylvester. Ah, sorry uh, about that no no worries ink by dan green page 11 sorry there you go there we go thanks for that the, the amazing dan green by the way made everybody look great um the next slide you've got is a Salvi Sema, Mike Esposito, Marvel team of annual number one page. Yeah. You know, what I liked about this page is a, you know, it's got the snicked Wolverine. So for all those people that have to have their Wolverine, it's got a panel for that in there. Um, but given how unaffordable uncanny pages are from this time period, this is in between X-Men 101 and, and 102. So relatively mm. early in the new X-Men era. And it's actually technically the second appearance of Jean Grey as Phoenix in that panel with the Professor X and, and Colossus down there. Um, you know, I don't think of Sal Buscema traditionally as a, an X-Men artist, but this was one that he did the, did the artwork on. Um, you know, Wolverine looks kind of like Wolverine of the time period there. Um, but yeah, I just thought, you know, a good example of, of early new X-Men artwork here um, in the Marvel team up world. Dave, do you remember this story? I, I don't, you know, this is one of those ones where I feel like, uh, wasn't there that big double page splash from this or like of them flying or something? That's that was like, uh, X-Men. I believe you're talking about the Marvel uh, team up 53, which was the first. Oh, player. that's why I'm thinking. This was the, one. this oh, had I'm the confusing them. cover. This, this had a Cochran cover, Lords of Light and Darkness. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Yes. I read it in in one ear, out the other ear, but yeah, yeah not not uh, not whatever, but a very memorable. You know that that Wolverine looks a lot like Wolverine in Giant Size One. I mean, it looks yeah. like they kind of yeah. almost half lifted it right out of there. So maybe he was like, "Well, what does this Wolverine look like?" Well, here, re look at this, and you know, <laughs> Sal was like, "Okay, here you go." Um, but uh, you know, a, a fine a fine story, but again, a nice early example. So yeah, yeah, I think I think, and I think we've got it estimated. Bill, what do we have as the estimate on this? I think it's relatively you know low and affordable for folks twenty five hundred to five thousand. You know, which if you're trying to go for an X-Men 101 or X-Men 102 page at this point in time, you're not going to touch it for anything close to that, I think. No, you're not. So, hey, who invented the snicked, by the way? Do we know? 
I was going to say, appearance page right there. I was about to say, is this the first appearance of Snicked? I mean, then you should just make that a 25, <laughs> I I mean, 25 million, 25 million <laughs> estimate. Yeah. Now, right? if that was the first, do your research, folks. Someone do your needs research. to do their research and find out when the first Snicked happened. I want to, I want to know. Uh, but because this Marcus is, early is doing it right now. Marcus is going out there, <laughs> going through page yeah. by page. <laughs> uh moving back to uh regular yeah, game so again, jackson right? guys you know i was thinking yep. again when I, I started with the paul smith era i think when x-men 166 is sort of the first issue i remember reading but then you had that period in between sylvestri and sort of when john romito jr left and you had you had folks like alan davis and you had jackson guys um filling in on issues and i i feel like jackson geis is one of the more underappreciated x-men artists out there obviously he did x factor as well and i thought this was a nice example of that um i remember this issue it's 216 then there was 217 which had the juggernaut issue which is also very memorable to me uh mm -hmm. and then i think here there's some speculation that alan davis who actually signed the page at the bottom had potentially helped draw the last panel since he had created the character um but not 100% sure on that one as well. But, you know, again, good storm page here. Um, thought it was just for folks that are looking for another artist, you know, another example. We just wanted to have a variety of X-Men related pages in here. I always thought this is based on no actual fact. So maybe this is something that someone from Marvel could answer the question someday. But if you look at sort of Geis's career arc, where he kind of was doing Micronauts and kind of was kind of exploding off the back end of Micronauts. And then they did the Micronauts became so popular. They did the X-Men Micronauts miniseries, yep. which, you know, yep. Micronauts was, I guess, direct market only right at that point. And then they did the X-Men Micronauts thing. And then, and then guys popped up over here in X-Men. It seemed like for half a minute, they were setting guys up to be the next regular, penciler of he was sort of following a similar career path that uh, the way they would try guys out and then bring them in i always thought they were setting him up to be the next x-men penciler and then i don't know it didn't happen and again that is based on zero information that was me as a fan thinking he would be the next guy but anyway yeah well you know it's also interesting because this one was inked by dan green right and then the next issue was steve Lealoha. so it's also like they were trying out different inkers on top of uh, on top yeah of different that. combos yeah different yeah. combos yeah see how it would look they were I, definitely I mean, they were looking for someone, but anyway, I always thought. Like, well, but then, close. then yeah. when did he get the X Factor job? Because maybe they said, you know, this is that's, good. We'll that's, I think it. that's a couple of years later still at this point. I think. Hmm. Well, I mean, I guess Inferno's coming up, so I guess it's soon. But yeah. so yeah, maybe that was the decision. But uh, maybe he I was want, a tryout, yeah. got him the X Factor yeah. job. But anyway, I, anyway, solid page. Um, and we have one more I wanted to show, which was uh, was a uh, Sal Buscema again from alpha flight back in the days now dave is oh hold on I, I need to point this out uh uh, uh shaheen just pointed out that snicked first appeared in giant size x-men number one so that's a that's a very undervalued book so now there's a reason that that book would have value so maybe mm -hmm. guys if you've ever heard of giant size x-men one apparently it actually now has some value so check that dave, out dave i i believe if I'm, my memory goes back i believe it was page seven from uh x-men giant size one where he first appears and he like flicks out is like does he when he like, cuts the guy's tie I that part so. yeah okay. i think that is the first thing. if if everybody could double check that that that's my memory of, of history there anyway um Alpha Flight. So I, you know, I think everybody was always, this just reminded me of a period where all of us were looking at those crossovers and trying to figure out the origins of Wolverine. And this from X, from Alpha Flight 33 was one of those sort of early telling of, of Wolverine's origin. And you always hoped it was going to be like the be all end all origin, which, you know, it never quite was, but it revealed bits and pieces of his relationship back with, you know, with we weapon, uh, well, what was it? Uh, weapon Alpha. Weapons X, weapon Weapons X. Alpha, Weapons yeah. X. Yeah, so I mean, it was sort of the, his his relationship with uh, with Vindicator and all those things. So, you know, I, I, again, you know, just sort of there, you've got the whole team <clears throat> at the bottom there with Wolverine, big Wolverine page, not quite a snick, but you've got the the claws bared there, which uh, which always counts for something as well. So, just nice variety. We just wanted to have some good X Men related pages for folks to put with their Wolverine claws, just in case they want to pick some of those up. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get to the props and costumes section. Of of what we're selling here.
All right. No, it's good. It's great to, to have some X-Men pages in there. It's like I mentioned before the show, we've got, got several X-Men art collectors in attendance and even on, on screen right now with, with David. And, Hopefully uh, you guys found something that you go, I got it. Why not? Pick it up. Um, mm -hmm. Now this one, I have been a big fan of the Daredevil TV show. Um, and I, I guess my longtime friend, a fan of the Hildebrands that when I was introduced to Star Wars, it was through a poster. Well, not only was it the Star Wars Treasury Edition, which was really how I got introduced, but then I remember getting those Cheerio boxes that had those little mini posters in it. And the mm -hmm. one that really stood out was the Hildebrandt poster that I saw there. And I saw the name Hildebrandt made a big impression that like an artist was actually there was like good artists and there were bad artists. And, and the Hildebrandt's made a difference uh, in what they were doing with the Star Wars franchise. Um, but for me, this was a great example of you know, sort of encapsulating it. And I know Greg was a fan of the Daredevil television series. So when we was asked to do this variant cover, um, I'm sure it had a lot to do with, uh, you know, what he was feeling and, and seeing as far as what he was seeing on the television show. And, and now that Kingpin is back, a little bit of a spoiler for those that have been watching or not watching the Marvel shows lately, um, he is back and it's good to see D'Onofrio back in his, his old form that he was on the the, I guess the original Daredevil TV show uh, before he made his, his his cameo appearance in some of those other shows along the way. Uh, but I think there's more to come with with D'Onofrio in his, uh, his, his Kingpin uh, identity here. And I think this is just a, a, a nice, if you want a nice big Hildebrandt colorful painting, you like the card sets, why not have a giant cover on your wall? I wouldn't mind having a Hildebrandt uh, that I could hang on the wall. I've never, yeah. never owned anything by them. I have, strangely enough, my Hildebrand piece, and I was going to say this for later, is I have the um, designs that Greg did for the glaive. From mm. the Holy shit. Yeah. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. It looked a little different, but yeah. Greg was actually uh, the first uh, artist that was, was doing concept designs for Peter Yates on the movie Crawl. Um, oh. So he worked on it in pre-production in 1982. So sell, then... sell those and buy the prop, man. Well, if I only had the prop mm -hmm. and the artwork. No, in this case, get rid of that artwork and get. But whoever ends yeah. up buying that for you know whatever the price is going to be, maybe they'll they'll hear this and they'll go, oh, maybe I can ask that guy about his his glaive artwork. But anyway, no, that was that's my Hildebrandt piece that I've got is the glaive artwork from uh, from Pearl. That's but awesome. this is nice. Yeah, wouldn't mind owning this one myself. And what's the I forget what was the size on this one. Mm, it's in the description, but it's pretty large. So it's got to be. Uh, usually he works pretty large. Right. So this is almost, uh, what's 37 by 28. Wow. Yeah. All right. So bigger than two by it's big. three. Wow. It's big. Well, that's, but that's it can be shipped form. with or without the frame. And then if you, you know, if you're looking for something more of a, a budget piece, this was also in there. We'll, we'll talk more about the William Plum collection in just a little bit, but another Hildebrandt. Uh, this is both Greg and Tim that you get here. So you get their signatures at the bottom. And if you're a Chewbacca fan like Dave is, this could be the piece for you. Oh, this, is from, this is from that Shadows of the Empire set, which uh, I guess that was that thing where they sort of, there wasn't a lot of Star Wars at the time. They kind of did like a video game and comic books and a card set to kind of fill in the middle, so to speak. They kind of created an adventure and a bad guy, Zizor, X-I-Z-O-R oh, yeah. or something, and a couple of new people. And yeah, you know. It exists. <laughs> it was it was a moment in, in Star Wars history. Yes. It was an official moment. It was an official moment. Maybe they'll come <laughs> back. Get in early. Or late. Whichever you look at. But so no, just, you know, again, if you're looking for a pencil piece, here's a... We yes, got, we very know. simple, nice pencil piece. The Hildebrand's doing two classic characters. Uh, and there's a, a very decent price on that. So yeah, not a bad thing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah. the John Byrne uh, Yoda. Yeah, you know, Dave and I were talking about this one last night because this this was interesting because I was walking around our warehouse and I saw this piece. So, so let's talk a little bit about William Plum. And, and, and Dave, you've got some more of a personal story about Bill Plum. Do you want to? I knew him a little bit. I don't, you know, don't certainly pretend to be uh, best friends with him. I knew him through... Uh, uh, another collector named uh, Wade LaJose. And Wade is a big Star Wars art collector. And Wade and myself and Brandon Allinger are the three co-authors 
of the uh, Ralph Macquarie book, the uh, Star Wars Ralph Macquarie art book. Um, and uh, Bill Plum was a collector and one of the first guys that sort of sought out, among other people, Ralph Macquarie and kind of said, I am a fan. I want, I'd love to have some of your stuff and started buying some of the Macquarie stuff, but really took it to a real wonderful extreme and really built just this pretty incredible Star Wars art collection that encompassed poster art, product art, uh, you know, uh, uh, comic art, comic strip art, you know, the, just really the works and built this really wonderful collection and over the years you know sold some things and i definitely had some things i had bought from him and things that i couldn't buy from him and uh he sadly i i i he i guess got ill and i don't know if he's passed away or not but this is coming from his family um and uh you know some of it i knew about but just the depths of his collection and so something like this star wars this uh, john byrne piece this is nothing i ever knew he had um you know byrne did very little star wars art you know he did like a cover or two from the original marvel run he's more of a star trek fan i think people know he loves star trek um and so this was just a shock to see and you know when i stare at it i'm not quite I'm not sure I would I'd be able to know it was Burn if it wasn't signed by Burn, but I you know you see it a little bit in the eyes, I guess, in the little center I, of the face. Yeah. Yeah, I mean this this is interesting. The shading, so the shading, yeah. Yeah, I saw it in the warehouse and walked up and I was like, whoa, what is that? Is that is that what I think it is? A John Byrne Yoda? And I was like, I don't think I've ever seen him draw Yoda. And it was. And I, I guess I recognize it, and then of course I recognize the signature that was down there pretty pretty quickly. Well the as signature well. helps. The signature yeah, helps. The signature does help a little bit. <laughs> Um, but, you know, as you were saying, Dave, yeah, I think he did the cover to Star Wars 13, which was a lot earlier in the Star Wars run for his official run. This was 82 would have been around the time he would have been you know, doing further in, further in uh, further adventures of Indiana Jones. And I was I was thinking to myself, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's like you go up to burn at the convention and, you know, it's probably one of the only Yodas that he drew. It's like, OK, what would you like, a Wolverine or a Yoda? And, and I doubt many people necessarily were choosing Yoda over that. Um, but this this exists. And I guess at the time, it's also an homage to 1982 and, and what was going on in film, which is E.T. was out. So he's got Force Home, which is his his, uh, you know, connecting what's, you know, Yoda to what was going on in Hollywood at the time with 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 E.T. and saying they are sort of one in the same. So his little statement on uh, on you know, but burn, burn always, I always find talking to him too. He, he's sort of more elevated than, than most people as far as what he's thinking. So, you know, he built that into the little sketch that you see here. And obviously from dated, it's interesting to see San Diego, 1982. I don't know what's going on in San Diego in 1982, but I see a lot of sketches where the artist put San Diego, 1982, whether it's, you know, burn or I think even Zach and, and those guys were doing that in, 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 when they were at the show or maybe it was 84. But I guess it was a big thing to be in San Diego and have a sketch. So people always wanted to at least recognize that it was a San Diego sketch. Um, interesting to think about that now that you know San Diego, maybe not as not might be quite the same thing that it is it was back in the day. But anyway, cool piece, cool piece. I just I wanted to point that out, and as part of this collection, as I say, we have just a, a, a wide selection that you'll see in the auction from the Bill Plum collection of a bunch of different Star Wars things. There's a Paul Chadwick piece that we didn't necessarily choose to put in here that again, wouldn't necessarily associate Paul Chadwick with, with Star Wars, but it's in his collection. So I think his goal was to try to find as many different artists that were there. And we'll come back to that one later. Then we'll come back. To okay. That. Oh, okay. Do you want to talk about it now? Dave? I can happy to talk about it. This was one I sort of uh, pulled up just because I just thought this was fantastic. Um, another sketch uh obviously this is mobius doing uh obi-wan kenobi um mobius basically did two star wars pieces in his entire obviously uh, you know the, the rumor goes that george wanted to hire him for the original star wars and he either couldn't do it or couldn't afford him or who knows you know we will we will not have that answer um but he did two pieces he did a piece for uh, a french uh entertainment magazine or newspaper that basically was a piece of C-3PO that kind of accompanied the original release of Star Wars. So that was more for publication, not for Lucas Arts themselves. And then years later, I believe he did a piece for one of the like comic art books where George 
sort of commissioned and purchased key pieces from some of the biggest names in comic art. And Mobius did a piece, and I think he did, I want to say, I think it's either like a, it's either like, I think it's maybe a Ray piece or something. I think it's a Ray or an Amidala piece. I, I can't remember. One of the newer female characters. I, I've lost track of which day it is. So you're talking about, in again, the, the history of Mobius. He did only these two Star Wars pieces. And so when this, I saw this in the catalog, I just thought this was kind of a revelation. And really, I, what I loved about it was you instantly could see how Mobius would have fit into Star Wars pre-production art. Like this is right up his alley, the the way the clothing is and all of that kind of stuff. And in some ways, maybe that he is a uh, an influence even on on Star Wars. But uh, I just I thought this was fantastic. And I will be the first to tell you uh if anyone is interested in this, I will certainly be who I will be one of the other phone bidders on this piece. Uh, I, I think it's, I think it's fantastic. I just, I was blown away by it. So wherever that fits in. Yeah. And I think it already has some bids too, doesn't it? Let's see. Uh, yeah. Three bids. Um, so, Hey, that's, uh, that's good. I mean, you're right. I mean, Moby's pieces, you know, ones that you would want to own that are not, that are kind of out of his, uh, you know, we'll, his, his, uh, his area of focus as a, as a creator, but you, you get him to do stuff like this. It's so rare. It's like every time I, I see uh, like a silver surfer piece, I want to own it. Right. I mean, just, but at least there so he, he at least did a silver surfer book mm -hmm. and there's a connection. This right. just feels, pages, but they're yeah, out there. yeah, exactly. This just feels like a, what might've been in a really wonderful way. Anyway, but I, I, I don't know what I'm arguing I'm for. It's just really great though. So, yeah. Well, it's already at the low end of the estimate, so I think it's probably going to go past the high end of the estimate before it's all uh, over. Uh, let's see. You know, here's a good question for you. It just because uh, I've never participated in a prop store auction. I mean, you have uh, floor bidding, uh, uh, absentee bidding. You've got uh, internet bidding. I mean, how does it all wind up at the end as far as uh you know the, the bidding going at, at, at the end of the end of the lots yeah um i think it, it works pretty much like most of the auctions that you participate in it is a live auction so that means a live auctioneer is going to be calling it it's uh there's three days of the auction there's day one which is march the 12th uh, and that'll actually be live so if you happen to be here in los angeles it's going to be over at the peterson automotive museum come up to the penthouse floor uh, folks like Anthony Daniels, uh, they're actually we're actually doing a preview event with him on the 11th. Um, he may show up at actually the event as well. Um, but I always find it's it's a good atmosphere. If you if you've ever you know I think it's interesting. Um, Dave and I sort of met at a at a at our first auction in, in Sotheby's in 1999, where I was there live and he was over the phone. Um, but that was my first auction of, of going and bidding in person. And I think if you can ever do that, you get to scope out the room, you get to see who you're bidding against. But there's an excitement in the room when you place your bid that, that you can't really replicate um, elsewhere. But most people are not going to be in Los Angeles. So most people will bid uh, via um, uh, the Internet. And I think you go to PropStore.com is the simplest way. You can just bid on our platform. It's relatively easy to use compared to some of the other ones that are out there. Um, but you can also go if you're if you're on some of the other um, mirroring platforms, you can go and use those as well. So we you know, we are, are on a bunch of different mirroring platforms. So if you're just you know, you'll you'll see prop store stuff pop up in your in your browser. Um, you can bid that way as well, but we recommend you go to PropStore.com. And as Dave said, too, you can be a uh, phone bidder. And I think that's for a lot of the folks that are bidding on especially bigger items, they may choose to do that. And that's where we'll call you five five to ten lots ahead of time, and we'll sit, sit with you and bid with you over the phone while things mm -hmm. are going. Well, that's good. Uh, so, you, so you're pretty much as feature rich as uh, as they come, I mean, as far as other yeah, yeah, I think we try to perfect it. I think we try to get better at doing that. Um, and, you know, sometimes people have, they like to do both. They like to do internet bidding and phone bidding just as a backup. And that's, that's fine as well. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, I think we have a few more pieces here from, uh, we got another plum collection piece. Yeah. I just found this one. I sort of sticking along, even though it's, um, it, it's a plum collection piece and it's also Star Wars, but it's, it's a Struzan. But what I liked about it is you also get ET in there and you get some other folks in there. Uh, it was just a very odd you, you know, unique piece by Struzan and frankly, at a price point that is approachable for most people. I think a lot of Struzan's movie artwork, especially if it was Star Wars, is going to be tens of thousands of dollars. This is starting a lot lower than that. Um, 
but just kind of a neat little piece. Dave, any insights on this one yourself? Or No, it looks, was it a book piece? It looks, or like an article, or what was it? It looks obviously like some sort of history of cinema. It, it's a kind of Olympics yeah. piece that was done. And oh. so I feel like it was just like a specialty piece, or it was supposed to be for advertising or, or things along those lines. But oh, yeah, just a weird, like a mishmash of different characters that you would never see on there. But it's also nice to get some well-known properties by Struzan into, into a piece. Well, it's uh, already got a nice absentee bid on that one, so that's good. Yeah. And then this Harry Lang piece, which is actually sitting behind me, I'll actually swivel over there so you can see what that looks like live and in person. There. You should bring it closer because it, it's so far back, it doesn't look as big as it actually is. It's quite nice and quite big. Uh, Harry Lang, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Harry Lang was a uh, another sort of uh, movie art, uh, I guess, movie conceptualist, I guess is a good, good word, illustrator. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually came out of uh, the aerospace industry, and he actually first started working on movies, I think, with 2001. Kubrick brought him in because of his expertise in actually, you know, working on designs for NASA. Um, and he wanted that level of authenticity and legitimacy and very much, uh, and obviously this is a Star Wars piece, but that same sort of ethos uh, that uh, like stuff was real and stuff worked, which I think uh, was part of what George Lucas was going for and certainly what Ralph McQuarrie, who had an aerospace background as well, were going for in their drawings. You know, I think McQuarrie, even if not, even if he wasn't being asked, like, how did it work? He was always thinking about how it worked and how something functioned and why. And so this is Harry Lang putting his mind to the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. Uh, and the two things that are quite interesting is obviously it's a lot of, you know, buttons, you know, switches and lights and whatever. But if you scroll down to the photo uh, of the what they actually built, you start to go, oh, they built basically what he drew, which is kind of a wonderful thing. And there's a logic to it. Again, it's it's space logic, but like everything has a reason for existing. And uh, I just love Lang's sort of role in Star Wars in 2001 and all these other movies. And I just thought this was a really neat, neat piece. Uh, this had been in a previous uh, prop store auction at a higher number and it has been uh i think somewhat significantly reduced uh and i think is at a much better spot uh and i just think it's really cool uh so the end yeah and signed by harry lang too so you're not gonna get it's pretty spot on isn't it at the end of the day i'm just comparing the two from what they uh what yeah. they built yeah that's pretty fantastic yeah, it's a it's a neat piece. Kind of those folks that like the Kirby collages and stuff like that. It's along the same lines of, of conceptualizing you know, what it is. And it, it, it's Harry Lang's got his own style, and similar to Ron Cobb, has got his own place in in movie history. Probably mm -hmm. even a bigger place and an earlier start and uh, an impact with movies like Two Thousand One. I'm just gonna say, thank you, David, for uh, the super chat. And uh, yeah, it's fun. I learn a lot during these as well. So trust me, props are not uh, my area of expertise, even on the art side of things. So this is fun for me as well. So I said, it's it's fun when I can look at this and put the art eye on it, because you do learn something new about this and new people that you maybe you didn't necessarily pay attention to uh, if you were just looking at their comic book artwork. And this is one uh, that I think most people out there know, and Dave knows especially well since, as he mentioned, that he wrote a book on this gentleman here. Um, but this is uh, going to be a Ralph McQuarrie piece. Dave, any as you were doing research on this, anything that you found about this particular sequence in Cloud City? Um, one of the things that people may not realize is that originally Princess Leia was being held on a prison planet and then the Death Star was a weapon. This is the original, this is in the draft of Star Wars that got very close to production. And it wasn't until they realized that they were over budget and were working on the final draft of the script that they realized they could save a huge amount of money by getting rid of the prison planet and putting her on the Death Star and basically have the Death Star be both the prison and the weapon of mass destruction. You basically get rid of a series of sets by doing that. So the original prison planet was Bespin, the Cloud City, under a different name. So the original Cloud City designs were done 
for Star Wars. Now, I don't think, I think this is one is that was, this is an empire drawing, but there are versions of the Cloud City that exist in the Star Wars um, uh, sort of set of uh, drawings that Macquarie did. And it was such a, a drawing that was like so well liked by him and by George that the Cloud City Bespin came right back in Empire. And obviously this is a uh, drawing from that period. But I've always been fascinated by that sort of that, that, that background information. Mm -hmm. So uh, just a really nice uh you know black and white uh this may be a prelim for one of the uh uh one of the paintings or, or a storyboard or something i honestly don't remember what it's a prelim for but it's just really nice really just gorgeous kind of everything you'd want in a macquarie plus you get a little bit of the millennium falcon on top of everything else so yeah pretty cool yeah the the, the cloud city is actually pasted down on this so it looks like they drew that and then decided they were going to add the clouds to it and the millennium falcon I'm looking at the art itself. I actually have the piece right here next to me. Um, but the Millennium Falcon is actually drawn on that. So it looks like they, they decided they were sort of going to create a scene out of it. It's identified as concept art. But yeah, to Dave's point, it, it was they were obviously trying to create a scene um, by reusing sort of a, a drawing that he had done of Cloud City mm -hmm. and, and applying a background to it. But nice. I mean, as far as, a, you know, a, a Macquarie you know, it it, uh, it it sort of checks the box as far as having a very finished look to it. Yeah, has a lot of detail and is very finished for a rough and bigger than a lot of his roughs. He worked small. And so sometimes you will see the most exquisite little Ralph Macquarie drawings and they'll be literally like four inches big. So there's something not something to be said for uh, uh, the size of this one as when Chuck held it up. So that's nice, too. Mm -hmm. I see it wasn't signed. Is that uh, typical of Macquarie production pieces like this? Pretty typical because most likely this was not something that was officially sold, probably something right. that left with someone. And, you know, he, he knew he drew it and George knew he drew it. They weren't right. signing stuff for each other. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's, his style is kind of unmistakable. You know, it's his. I was just kind of curious, uh, yeah. you know, if, if a lot of these get signed or not. But that makes sense, right? I mean, if they never make it back to his hands, I mean, when it's work, you, you don't, you're not thinking about signing stuff. Right. You're not signing because you're not, this, isn't, this wasn't a gallery show. <laughs> Dave, when yeah. you guys did the book, did, did you did you have a total number of drawings that Macquarie had done uh, for the Star Wars saga? Do you have a sense of? I don't anymore. I'm, I, you, I'm sure I used to know the number of drawings in each section, and I that that, that number has That's escaped me. Pull up to a two-volume <laughs> set that you guys There's a lot of art. There was a lot of art in a great way. you guys tried way. to track yeah. down as much of it as you could. Yeah, um, I mean, luckily they had a lot of it at Lucasfilm, and then we were able to sort of uh, add to it through private collections. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, this piece is a little more finished, obviously. This is one of his color pieces. Nobody did planets uh, like uh, like Macquarie. This is a uh, a prelim for the an Alderaan matte painting uh, of obviously Alderaan before it is destroyed, um, and uh, just just beautiful, just from the star field to the purple colors. Uh, you know, I won't exactly say his color use is Frazetta esque, but it, there's a there's a relationship there, like where he'll pull sometimes with his colors certain purples, greens, and oranges, which are not necessarily the colors that every artist rushes to use and uh, really does some wonderful things with them. Um, and it really looks like a painting of a planet from outer space, which is really, I guess, ultimately what the goal was. Uh, and again, to get a finished, and again, it's not a perfectly finished piece, but to get a, a full color Macquarie is pretty something special. And the size, when Chuck was holding it up again, um, that's kind of what a lot of the finished Macquarie Star Wars pieces, like the very famous portfolio plates, look like. They're not much, they're, that's the size he worked in. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you know, there's, you know, he did do some of, he did do matte paintings that were larger, like actual matte paintings that were shot, but he worked small. And so that's about as big as his pieces got. And it's a fully finished beautiful piece i mean I, yeah. I i really like it yeah i'm looking at the original here and you can see the details there it, it the the texture on it is amazing i'm almost like looking at it to see if i can see the sand dunes on the on the planet um 
it, it just it, whatever you know whatever he did it just the texture on it is you, you can see it at, at at a granular level on there so it's a pretty amazing you know for a study it is uh is quite impressive and as dave said those famous um uh, portfolio plates that you've seen that are sort of finished paintings they're not out there either you know i think the other thing is a lot of this stuff did get saved by the, the archives um, or by Lucas, and you're just not going to see these in private hands. So to get a, a finished painting like this is a pretty special piece. Well, that's uh, well, clearly. I think it's already got a few bids on it too. So I think I think you're going to have a lot of people that feel this is a uh, nice piece. And is this the kind of stuff we're going to see in the uh, in the Lucas Museum when it finally opens in uh, 2025 or so? I don't know. They keep sort of saying there's not going to be a lot of Star Wars, so who knows? You know, we're yeah. hoping it's all comic art. Actually, it's not a Star Wars <laughs> museum, yeah. So we'll. Oh, see I know. It. I mean, yeah. I know it's more his aesthetic, right? But I'm I'm curious to see what uh, what pieces from the Star Wars universe will actually make it to the Lucas Museum. I'm, I mean, whatever it is, it's got to be pretty phenomenal. Uh, let's see here. Ah, another uh, Blade Runner here. Yeah, these are these are pretty large. So, you, you know, right off the bat, you may not recognize what this is. But um, for those that were that love comic book movie adaptations, uh, think of the second cover that Brent Anderson did of uh, Blade Runner, the movie adaptation. And this is the famous scene where you've got Harrison Ford sort of dangling down, uh, you know, sort of looking on the top of his head and sort of seeing him stretched out. And this is a matte painting. And so uh, we've got a number of these matte paintings. What What is a matte painting? Um, think about it before they had CGI. This was a way that companies or that the, the, the production companies would save a lot of money because they could, you know, draw or paint. Well, it wasn't just saving money. I mean, in some cases, this was the only way they could yeah. achieve some of these sort of effects and stunts, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's fair as well. So, the, you know, the, the part that's blacked out, this is where they would insert a live shot. Um, to mm -hmm. be paired up with a painting that made it look like one continuous uh, image. And so on screen, it would look like, yes, this was all one big uh, shot scene that is live and in person. But what's interesting is the way that that Yurisich would have to paint these. It's, it's a little bit fuzzy. So you would think it would be like nice and crisp. But mm -hmm. I think part of the magic of this was being able to match the colors and, and sort of have a little bit of fuzzier detail so that when they actually merge them together, the backgrounds would merge in with it because if it was too crisp, it would stand out. Um, so in this case, a lot of the browns and other things like that, the colors that were chosen, uh, you know, was was purposeful to make it look more realistic. So I think when people remember that scene from Blade Runner where he is dangling down there, you don't think of this being a painting that's sitting behind him. You, you think of it no, as it's an amazing skill. And it's one of those things that now that everything is digital, I think they sometimes forget, which is there are limits to a camera lens. And if a camera lens shooting, you know, in kind of rainy darkness that Blade Runner was or the Blade Runner set was, were they to set this shot up and were you to have Harrison Ford dangling there and you were in focus on Harrison Ford dangling, you are going to lose the background, you know, whatever they call it uh, with lenses, the bokeh, you know, you're going to, it's going to blur. It's going, you're going to lose some of it. And so in your painting, you are attempting to capture what the flaws that a lens would bring to the background. I think, and I think that's part of the incredible skill that, uh, how do you pronounce his last Matthew name? Matthew Yursevich. Yursevich. Uh, that he had, and again, the great Matt Painters did, which is to really act like a camera in their mind. And again, as I said, is I think nowadays a lot of times with digital, excuse me, they have a habit of like not thinking it through and all of a sudden I'm seeing things I shouldn't see. It's too crisp. It's too... Uh, there you go, Richard Friend. Thank you. Diffusion is one of the trickiest things to achieve in pen and ink. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I'm I'm standing here criticizing. I certainly couldn't do it if my life depended on it. But yeah, when you see it done right, it's quite incredible. And uh, and certainly, this guy's one of the masters. Yeah, yeah. 
and you know, we'll go through a few other paintings that he did here too. Um, this is obviously from Blade Runner, and you know, from a, a movie collectibles, Blade Runner is very well loved. Obviously, it was not well loved when it first came out. But that's also not just Blade Runner, but also a key, the key finale yeah. from Blade Runner. So it's kind of a double there. Yeah, it is. Right. And I'd say in general, if you were looking for props from Blade Runner, they're very hard to come by in general. So to have a great piece of artwork yeah. from a pivotal scene. Um, you know, in your collection as a collector, you know, if, if hopefully you've got a large enough room, but if you had a movie room, this would look, you know, pretty phenomenal in it. This, uh, folks out there can guess is from Ghostbusters. So this is, uh, from the first movie. And again, one of these things where you recognize the gar gargoyle and the, or the, um, what do they call those? The, the terror dogs in the, uh, in the top, uh, the, in the foreground. And then you can build, do you want to go to the actual, uh, I guess the scene that they put, they put in the movie? Yeah, let's see, right, uh, there we go. There we go. So then you've got the sort of the street down there where they insert the live. Yeah, so that's basically, that's real Central Park West in New York City, and obviously the building and the gargoyle, the terror dog, is, is the painting. And uh, you put them together, and that looks like it's on the top of the building in a great yeah. way. That's kind of a 101 of matte painting, yeah. But what's great about this particular painting is it sort of stands by itself. And I think it, you recognize it, even though you don't necessarily have the, the taxi cabs and other things drawn in, in super detail on it. So I like I like this one. And obviously Ghostbusters, another classic film that most people would want something from. Uh, and then I, there's another one here that I think it was interesting. Like, you know, those two are great. But if I actually, well, we could, yeah, we, this is Star Trek, the motion picture. Can so I skip ahead too far? Um, yeah, we can go to the next one. But the one I wanted to talk about was... Um, was the other one from Logan's Run. Okay. And I think, yeah, this is the one that I think Dave and I were sort of in agreement on. It's like, if we had to own one of these, this one to me, when I saw Logan's Run, and I lived in Washington, D.C. When, when I was a kid, but to see the Capitol building sort of overrun with all this vegetation, it looks so realistic to me as a kid. Um, it, maybe not so much, you know, when you see the painting itself, but it, it, the, the effect worked on screen where I truly believe that they were in the future and the city that I lived in was no, you know, sort of in the state of ruin. And it's a great standalone painting. There, there it is. What you'll notice is the, the painting that you just showed is red. Um, and the reason for that was typically when they would do map paintings, there's different ways that they would do it. But sometimes they would actually paint on top of another photograph. And typically they would start with a black and white photograph. For this particular one, they actually started with a, Matthew started with a color photograph. And what happened because it was a color, the the um, the red that was coming from the photograph was actually bleeding through into the painting and causing, especially over time, it caused the painting itself to have a reddish hue to it. So that's why it looks a little bit different than what you actually see in the movie itself. But, you know, again, just sort of, you know, for me, this was wow. I couldn't tell this was a painting when I was a kid, you know, maybe maybe as I've gotten older, but um that this was the big reveal at the end of, of Logan's run that they're actually in the real world. It wasn't just a sci-fi place. It, to me, it was my home city, you know, that, that had been overrun. Dave, why did you like this particular piece or. Uh, who knew that uh, they were predicting the future, that this would be exactly uh, as it is today. This is, if you were in Washington, Washington DC right now, that's exactly what it looks like. So yeah. That's what's right. <laughs> yep. That is so true. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, no, this is, uh, so I assume, you know, as collectors go in, in props, I mean, are there guys that are gals that just focus on Matt, uh, painting or is it something that you would have as a complement to other pieces in your collection typically? I, do mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't think there's a ton of them out there. It's, it is a mm -hmm. bit of a lost art. There aren't a, a lot of them necessarily. Some are done on glass. These, most of these are done on, um, on board but um you have to have a big space to be able to display these and i think that's mm -hmm. that's the thing is if you've got the space for it some people may love to put these out there but i don't you know i don't know if there's just people that are exclusive matte painting collectors i would guess it's more i've got one and it goes along with some movies that i really love um dave do you have any matte paintings in your collection I have uh, like one or two much like smaller ones, not not one that you would consider to be like the traditional large giant matte painting, um, which is fine. Uh, you know, 
I'm not sure I've ever met anyone that only collects matte paintings. I certainly know people that appreciate them. I think they have them more like they love a movie and then they were able to track down a matte painting that connects to the movie as mm -hmm. opposed to being a matte painting collector, just to answer that question. I think I've seen uh, some collectors who like to focus on like the backgrounds and animation, right? The Because they're very painted, especially Disney stuff, right? I think I've seen a few collectors who, who tend to you know, they have more than one. And that, that made, that's, I guess that was why I thought about that with matte painting, but uh, these are more rare, I think. Um, did you want to look great. at that? And I think they're, they're key paintings from memorable scenes in movies that we all loved. So I think yeah, mm -hmm. that's the great thing about yeah. this collection that's coming in, in this particular auction is, you know, again, my favorite, my favorite was the Logan's run, but somebody else, you know, it's a Blade Runner fan, you know, may choose the Blade Runner. One. So not to say sure. I'm not a Blade did you want to look at that Star Trek uh, one, or did no, you we can? I mean, I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a. There's two of those. I believe we've got sort of the prelim in here. That's a, it, it got more of a reddish hue, but you know, it's I believe Golden Gate Bridge there, where it's sort yeah. of showing the future of this. And again, the the black area would be the area that they would have the ocean, and so it looked like the waves were sort of coming up underneath the uh, the bridge here. Um, but you know, frames frames everything up and and was a set, set the tone for that 1970 nine star trek movie i believe it was yep picture um starfleet okay. i guess is the traditional uh san francisco is the traditional home to starfleet in the star trek films yes mm -hmm. john byrne just told me that so yeah <laughs> i think yoda <laughs> actually told john byrne to tell you that <laughs> uh now for something a little different here some uh, some animation art. Some yeah, so there's there's a little bit of animation sprinkled in as well. I think that you know some of these ones that we used to see all the time at the Warner Brothers store are are becoming rarer, um, if if you can believe that, and sort of more popular again. I think Who Framed Roger Rabbit is one of those. Uh, I wanted to show this one. I think Dave uh, really appreciates the hairy back in the in the foreground <laughs> as well as the uh, the sexy lady in the front. You know Jessica Rabbit. But. I'm sure. Uh... I'm sure what's his name, Bob Hoskins, would be pleased to know that he he lives on forever with his shirt <laughs> off like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a unique, uh, no, it's a good Jessica Rabbit. I think that's you know what most people would be looking for out of a, uh, a, a Roger Rabbit cell. Um, but I, I thought it was a, a nice example of one of those. And you know the Warner Brothers stores don't exist anymore. It's hard to believe. It's probably been like 20 years since those closed, but. They were a staple, I believe, when most of us were, were growing up in the 90s. There was even one in Cleveland, David. There you go. I wish I could so. have been flown in to visit it. <laughs> <laughs> gonna bring, they're going to bring them back. They're going to bring them back. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I actually ha I have a piece of art that I bought at a Warner Brothers store. So hanging on the wall. Okay, not a it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's that Alex Ross homage to uh, Cockrum's. Uh, you know the, the whole team and everything, and signed by both. But I, but you know, there was a few good pe things that could come out of those Warner Brothers stores back back in the day. Yeah, I mean, the, those Batman good. animated cells that were coming out That's of there true. too. Dave, you do have yeah. some of those. You you do. I have some of those, and I have one of my favorite things, which is they made a uh, Batman animated uh, Two Face bookends, good oh, yeah. half and bad wow. half. Uh, and you can still find them from time to time, like on eBay. I've never seen that. That's awesome. So it's really wonderful. I highly recommend for anyone interested. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna be uh, going over to eBay after this and trying to find something I've never never seen that before. Uh, a little bit more. Um, anim uh, yeah, animation. another variety of thing that you may not think are in a prop store auction. There's Dragon Ball artwork. My understanding is this was uh, this was actually sent over, and I think the stamps that are on there. There's there's more of a description on those. Um, you know, Dragon Ball, not necessarily my generation, but I, I do believe it's. You know, I've seen a lot of people that this is sort of the like the the next, which is I guess you know the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you know, versus uh, Spider Man. It's sort of the next generation of animation that that I think is is catching on or has caught on for a lot of folks. So I'm glad we could have a variety of of things like this in the auction for yeah. that people are Dragon Ball fans. Yeah, I miss this era. Yeah, I have no idea what we're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> I think my kids like it though, um, even though it was that uh, it's been that long ago. I think it's still popular uh, with the with the teens and whatnot. So, Bill, uh, Bill, I sent you something in the private chat if you want to want to look at that and show it to the audience if you like. Oh, you don't oh, have shoot. to. Sorry. Yeah, no, 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 I just see. I just sent it. Oh shoot! Yeah, here. <laughs> oh, look at that on demand. Look at that. Yeah, pretty this great, huh? Awesome. 
Yeah. I love it. Oh my gosh. That, that was a that was a Warner store original product. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm not a DC guy and I love this. I I feel like I need to get <laughs> this is crazy. That's awesome. I like how you have the Marvel books in the middle of them or the JLA Avengers. Well, it's it's very equal opportunity, I guess. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's just a it's great just a stuff. great design and made to be a bookend. I mean, it's really yeah. perfect. So yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, sorry. That's back great. back to the yeah. back to the props and the art. <laughs> sorry, yes, we didn't mean to bring yeah. these. Down. These are lot seventeen hundred and ninety two. Dave's bookends. <laughs> Those, <will> be <laughs> Those are not mine. I just like them. Just like it. Just a fan. <laughs> just a fan. No, I just um, want. I just rewatched Aliens about ten days ago, so you know. Yeah, Aliens is a fa- it, you know some 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 uh, fan favorites out there. I, I did this more as an example of storyboard art, and I think that's another type of art that we've got in this auction. Um, you know, again, comic book artists get called on to do storyboards all the time, uh, but they're you know nice individual panels similar to comic books. So it's 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 sort of this the the cousin, so to speak, of comic book panels. Um, but they, they obviously re- relate back to key scenes in the films. Aliens, I thought, was a good one. I think we've got some other ones that I'll show here in just a bit. But um, if you like this, you know, another good thing that you could collect or start collecting, you know, storyboard copies are more available. And, and on a production, they would give binders of storyboard copies to a lot of the folks that were working on the film for reference. These are the original hand-drawn storyboards. In today's world, a lot of this is done on computers, so you don't necessarily find this or you find sort of semi, sem, somewhat printed out versions that they may touch up by hand. Um, but back in the 1980s, like like this is, um, you did have the, the full-fledged hand-drawn storyboards. And I think it's from a great movie. Mm-hmm. And a nice sequence, too. Uh, nice these, sequence. these Harry well, Potter Didn't Cameron do well. some of those yeah. himself, too? I mean, I, didn't, I was trying to read the description while I was Yeah, he at, did, although I don't, these I don't think. These I don't believe are not Cameron. Cameron yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes, he did, he did do some of those for aliens. Um, the next ones, are, which are Harry Potter, these uh, these are actually a hybrid between um, storyboards and licensing art. This is actually a guy named Doug Brody um, had taken the original storyboards from Harry Potter and for licensing purposes had readapted those. Um, but this is the Monster Book of Monsters um, sequence there. There's a bunch of different ones that all come together. But I just thought they were some pretty fan. You don't find a lot of Harry Potter artwork. It hasn't been released. I don't believe the Warner Brothers archives has released any of the official storyboards so what you do find are these licensing pieces like this that are out there so if you're a harry potter fan want a piece of artwork these are pretty fantastic and i I think it's again another great sequence of uh memorable you know it's a memorable prop and it's also just you know a memorable sequence in the film i think this is the third or fourth film dave this is from azkaban is the third I think that's right. Get yeah. a little confused. Well, that, that is pretty cool. Yeah. If you're a Harry Potter fan, some good stuff. And there's, like, what, six pages here. So if you want to split them with a friend, you can. If you want to keep all the, you know, all the pages related to that together, you can. So. An 11 by 17 board. Yep. I think so. I guess costume design. Yeah. Another one is, you know, another, I guess, another cousin is is costume design. So if, you know, you may, maybe you can't afford an Indiana Jones outfit. Um, this is, this is one from the third movie uh, that I think we all remember, but here's the costume design for it. You may not have room for a mannequin to put the costume on, but I think most of us art collectors could put this in a binder or put this up on the wall. And it's got all the cool notes around the creation of it that the costume designers would use. And so I thought this was a neat one from a, a memorable Indiana Jones movie as well and of a key character. And you can see the uh, AP in the bottom right. This is Anthony Powell, uh, who was the costume designer on the movie and sort of a very, very talented designer and just kind of neat that it's from him, you know, wherever that fits in. Very nice. Uh, so now we have a... Uh, yeah, so this is, this is just talking about... So I think you were asking about the, the structure for the auction. And I think what's a little different with... with uh, I guess prop auctions in general is typically a lot of items do have reserves and, and items on days one and two of our auction. Uh, a lot of them will have reserves. I, I will tell you, you know, nothing, the reserves are never more than whatever the low end of the estimate is. If that gives you a little bit of a guide, um, but something that we did 
a little bit different for this prop store auction is on day three of the auction, everything is being listed at $100 with no reserve. So there are no reserves on day three of the auction. And I just wanted to point out a few of the art pieces that are on day three. Um, we had sold some of the more finished versions of some of the Star Wars Dark Empire covers in the back. Um, this is issue six. And so we do have this. This is a, a, a large 11 by 17 pencil drawing by Dave Dorman. So here, here is the original here. Um, obviously a prelim, the, not the, the final version of it, but still neat. Um, you got the, the basic design there. And it actually comes with the, um, the comics. And what's interesting, if you're a comic book collector, is that you've got the platinum edition, you've got the rare gold edition, and then you've got a regular edition that's signed by um, Cam Kennedy, uh, Tom Beach, and uh, Dave Dorman on it as well. And then I think for some reason they threw in a copy of issue five as well with this with this lot. But, um, you know, cool lot, especially if you can't, if you weren't lucky enough to actually own the final cover for this. Here's something you can, starts at a hundred bucks. Hopefully you can get it for yourself. I will say something semi-sacrilegious, which is I actually much prefer seeing Dorman's pencils. Uh, so I actually get a kick out of seeing a little bit more of the uh the structure dare you say uh to the uh the, to the work uh that that i see more in the pencils so i actually prefer his pencils uh i, I well i see what you mean i think uh i like i like dave's paintings as well but uh but these are nice it's like sometimes getting to see simonson pencils right I anyway mean, which we which is about all we ever get to see anybody own as well it's uh it sometimes is a lot nicer to see the process um cool Marcus says the cover made its way to calf, Chuck. So we should both be happy for that. I believe it did. I believe there's a collector that has a few of those Dark Empire covers. And I guess Dave, how, what do you how do you consider the Dark Empire books in the uh, the Star Wars mythos? It was I actually really like them. I love uh, Cam Kennedy's work uh, on the interiors. Uh, I think they're really cool stories. I think they hold up. I have no idea if I don't think they are considered official anymore. They're not canon anymore. But I thought they were really interesting you know and, and and oddly enough as sort of that those last batch of movies kind of looped around with like the empire the emperor being back and whatnot and sort of some cloning and whatnot they definitely sort of took from them even if they weren't uh canon anymore so i, I think they they uh they comport themselves quite well and they hold up so yeah yeah, and I remember it was a time where they became sort of a revival of the Star Wars franchise. And I remember seeing on QVC where they were selling those gold and platinum editions of the comics. But that means that it had sort of gone back into pop culture where nothing new Star Wars had really excited anybody, especially comic books. So I do think it was a revival of somewhat of the Star Wars comic book franchise um, and then split off into all the different uh, storylines that they ended up creating for dark horse and other places anyway so that was one example bill i think we've got a few other examples here's a nice you know david Matt mattingly novel covers um which look really finished to me so i don't actually have those here <laughs> live and in person with me but they just look really nice to me you know as far as uh you know they might be small little paintings but all of them pr pretty pretty tight for a small painting well, he wanted Dave, you know much about Dave Mattingly? <laughs> I don't. I feel like he's very much uh, after me, if that makes any sense. I feel like he was kind of doing these later adaptations that I just, I'd already had the adaptations and never really picked any of these up. Obviously very skilled, but uh, a little bit of a hole for me. Yeah. But again, you know, buy them all, keep some you like, split them with a friend if you'd like, or... But it just yeah, I mean the the, the lot is obviously price to move, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Starting at hundred bucks, can't go wrong with that. You cannot. Uh, let's see here. Ah, and this, I was actually surprised that we had this as well. So if you're looking for some Boris Viejo uh, prelims, they're in the auction as well. Again, some Star Wars related stuff, which you also don't see for Boris very often. Two prelims by him, um, a little bit rougher than you would find for the final prelims, but still. Boris, nonetheless, he's having a bit of a, a, a comeback uh, in the in the comic art world, so to speak. But um, again, sort of as I went through the auction, I was like, "Oh, we have some Boris's in here. This is this is kind of neat." 
I can't say I've seen a lot of uh, non-painted boars before. So whether they're this rough is how or not. he worked. Yeah, I, he used to do all his prelims in um, in well, I've seen pencil pre prelims as well, but I, I remember seeing a lot in in sort of this pen and ink, and then he would usually do a you know some colors on top of that for the more final prelims, and then move on to the painted style. But he mm -hmm. usually work it out in a pen and ink style for his prelims, and some of them are very tight. Um, these are a little bit looser, uh, and obviously you got a pencil and a and sort of an inked version here as well. But cool to see him doing Star Wars. That that's you know obviously he's known for his sexy women and uh, sci-fi sci-fi and uh, muscular men. Yes, exactly, uh, and, and all of his calendars, right? Yeah. So. And this was kind of a, a I guess, an un, a, a little known project of, of Neil Adams that was done, uh, I guess, Warp. I think this was a like a play or something like that. And it came out of a collection where he gifted this to to someone. And, you know, again, just you know, nice Neil Adams, nice little head sketch. But might might surprise you that there's a Neil Adams in a in the prop store auction. So I wanted to just point it out. If you didn't get your Neil Adams sketches from him at a, at a convention. Here's here's an opportunity here and, then, and a nice signature on it, too. And another one of the one hundred dollar starting bid yep. Sunday pots. Yeah. Just a just a hundred bucks just to start. All so right, tune in. That's on March fourteenth, yeah. which is day three of the auction. So coming up, not too far. Ten days from now, Bill. Ten days from now. Uh, do you have a lot of work to prepare for it, or is it all more PR we based? Do. Stuff? Yeah, as you said, we're going to be going to the the Peterson Museum. We got to move a display over there. We're doing a. Um, we're doing a um, preview night, uh, as I sort of alluded to, with, with Anthony Daniels on the 11th. Um, that's pretty much sold out to the public at this point in time. But uh, those who, who, who signed up, uh, it should be a great night. Um, weather's still supposed to be good here in L.A. Um, but we'll, we'll, um, we'll also have some other special guests that we're just about to announce as well uh, that are linked into Indiana Jones, which will be kind of nice. Um, but it, it's always a fun event for these things, and but a little bit of work to, to get organized for them to make them an event because you do want this to be special. As I said, when I first went to an auction, uh, it was a special event for me, and I think that's the thing is this could be somebody's very first auction, and I think we realize that, and I think we want to make it special for the people that actually do show up on the day. And uh, you know, if you if you do happen to be in LA, this, that's the the way to do it. And there'll be some exciting stuff. Um, we'll start going over some of the props there. I think the some of the highlights are that we will have Anthony Daniels' personal collection of, of items that he kept from the Star Wars franchise. Um, Prop Store sold the first half of that collection out of London in our last auction back in November, but we have a second half of it. And one item that we, we're not necessarily going to show here, I don't think, is as, yep, well, there it is there, is the, uh, the C-3PO head um, from Anthony Daniels. So this is a screen-matched C-3PO head. So this means this was one of the ones that he wore uh, and it matches to the uh, sort of the final yeah, scene from Jedi, from Jedi. And, 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 you know, it's it's you can kind of see and we, we were able to match it based on the the um, uh, just all the wear that you see on there, which obviously was intentional distressing to it. But this matches, I believe, to the scene where he's with the Ewoks towards the end of the film. And uh, you just you imagine this was like the last thing as they were wrapping up filming that Jedi movie This is like, oh, I'm going to keep this head. And this is the one. And he's had it in his storage, you know, since then, and it's still in that same condition. Which for prop collectors is a, is a dream to have it in this collection, in this condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the last one we had was from Star Wars, which is the first movie. So he kept one from the first movie, and he kept one from the last movie. Um, but he had reconditioned the the first movie one, so it, it was bright and shiny, and it was great for taking pictures with. But what's amazing about this particular one is the the finish on this, and the fact that it it's as it was in the movie and even the lights in the eyes are the original eyes that they still still light up so that's pretty mm -hmm. fantastic well this one's got some bits on it already too but you, so you knew that one was going to have a lot of it is I mean, it'll be the highlight of that it's it's a rare opportunity i mean if you think about the characters in star wars you've got you know stormtroopers which there are a lot of stormtrooper helmets and we have a great one in this auction and um, you know, that that's a great thing if you want to get in and, and own something. But of the main characters, you've got, you know, Darth Vader helmets, which typically now are going over a million dollars a piece. And then you've got really from a helmet perspective, you've got C-3PO as, as far as main characters. Um, and then you've got you know, some other fantastic, you know, some cantina members and other folks. But to have one of the main cast uh, represented as a mask. When, what I like about this is that, you know, because it's 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 a mask it's not necessarily this one's not necessarily deteriorating 
over time in the same way that maybe a latex mask might. So I, I think it's great that, you know, it should, should hold its condition um, for a long period of time and, you know, be an amazing thing that if you could wake up and see that in your house. So. Staring right back uh, at it. If you had that, well, you know that you've, uh, you've led a good life. If you're able to have that in there, that's, that's awesome. I mean, but who wouldn't, right? Um, this is, uh, but yeah, this, this is cool. Well, it's amazing that he held on to it that long too. That's, that's, it uh, is. that's and, but this isn't the only thing he's got over like 130 items that he's got in there, whether it's things like trading cards, uh, whether it's his hands, whether it's little, you know, sort of gribble, you know, yeah, the, big and small, his scripts, pieces of wow. dialogue, call sheets, uh, just back. kind of the work signed a lot of stuff, you know, if he kept it, even if it was uninteresting, he signed it, which makes it more interesting. It was really, I mean, he definitely had a real eye on the future. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, I mean, we don't, you yeah. know, but th those are the, like the rare stories we hear about comic artists, right? Saving their artwork for yeah, for their later years. Clearly, he had a plan in mind, and it, and it, and it's worked well for him. I mean, to be ahead of it that long, that's wonderful. Yes, and this, gonna, this, you're going to get to talk to him at that uh, at the at the, uh, the live event, right? Yeah, it'll, it'll it'll be great. Yeah, he'll be there. He'll be on stage. He'll be. He's actually going to lead his own Q and A, I guess, uh, um, on stage to to talk to everybody about it. So it'll be good to hear from him. Uh, and I think there's a chance that he'll show up actually at the auction as well. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think for, for, it's very rare to get something directly from some of the actors that are involved. And unfortunately, many of the Star Wars actors have passed away over time. Um, it's great that he's able to do this with fans before, uh, you know, his family has to do this, you know, years down the road. So I think it's, it's just a great way of sort of parting with these things, telling the stories of what they are, allowing fans to have a piece of it. And the fact that he signed a lot of these things, um, you, you know, there, there's lots of, you know, 50 trading cards. You can just, you know, keep, yeah, there's a, there is definitively, you can spend a million dollars, but you could probably spend a hundred dollars and get something from Anthony Daniels collection, which is kind of neat just conceptually. Yeah. Yeah. His comic now, books. Out of curiosity, if I come back to that lot, is there a way to look at just the items from, the, that Anthony has uh, there is put. if you go to the main page there's a filter that, that should allow you to see that um, and and all the the big items such as that head will be on day one of the auction which is March the 12th um, and that's when a lot of the big big ticket items are going to be going so if you go under yep if you go under the under categories you go under category. oh yeah. okay I'm sorry right here okay it should have collections I believe yeah and then it ah. says Anthony Daniels. So click on that and then you'll see everything that's in the Anthony Daniels collection. And similarly, there's a way of filtering too to just to see the original art in there. Um, so you can you can apply that filter just to see the art lots that are in there as well. But oh, cool. Yeah, great. Well, as I, David said, I, didn't know, I, I didn't realize how that filter stuff works. So that's that's awesome. Yep. Yep. We we'll wow. try to add features to the website to make it a little bit easier. But thank you for showing that. Thanks for asking about that. Um, there's also just you can type in keywords. So if you were to type in Anthony Daniels at the top, I think you'd probably sure. get similar results as well. That's another easy way of doing it. But um, you can see there's you know other collections like Howard Kazanjian, who was the producer on uh, Return of the Jedi as well. So there's there's folks, um, you know, Stuart Ziff, who worked with Ghostbusters, and, and mm -hmm. then there's the William Plum collection. So you can you can filter by collection. You can filter by different movies. There's a lot of different ways that you can sort of take a look at everything. But yeah, a lot of this stuff in, in Anthony, I think, you know, he wants fans to have it. So he didn't start a lot of these very high as well. I think as far as some of the reserves on these are pretty reasonable. Uh, so everything hopefully will sell and hopefully will go to somebody. And it's interesting, like, as you see at the bottom there, there's like those those patches that were part of his undersuit. You always mm -hmm. wondered how the wires and other things, you know, sort of were part of the costume. Well, that was it. That was movie magic, which is they screen printed them onto a black piece of, of cloth and they put them at the joints and you can sort of see some of the, the magic underneath the, uh, underneath the costume. That's, uh, that's very cool. Yeah. But that a great stormtrooper helmet. This is also from return of the Jedi. Uh, Dave, you probably have more insight than anybody on this particular helmet. Yeah. This was actually the first movie prop I ever owned. It's literally this prop. I'm not the seller of this. I, I uh, moved it out of my collection a few years ago and the guy I sold it to is now selling it, but this was originally in my collection. I actually uh, won this slash bought it out of a, out of like a phone auction out of the back of toy shop magazine. If people remember toy shop magazine back, back in 96. And it's a, 
it's a it's a Jedi helmet. Uh, it uh, interestingly enough, if you jump ahead a couple of the photos, it has a mailing label from uh, that says Blue Harvest from Yuma, uh, Arizona, where they shot the jaw. Um, <clears throat> the Jabba barge scene uh, taped into the inside of the helmet uh, that we think the guy, whoever, you know, took the helmet, who may, probably maybe the actor or something, did it, uh, put it in there himself to maybe remember where it was. Uh, kind of just, you know, it's yellowed a little bit, but beyond the yellowing, it's in really crisp condition. All the... Uh, all the uh, the rubber and the, the 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 brow and the lenses are all there. The snaps, the the helmet compartment, the uh, construction helmet sort of uh, interior is all there. Uh, really, just nice condition. All the uh, stickers are all really minty in a really great way. Um, yeah, just uh, just a really fabulous helmet i was sad when i let it go uh but you know i had others uh but i uh i let it go and uh, here it is again all these years later so uh, i've missed it but uh this is your opportunity <laughs> yeah it's kind of oh, like yeah. the x-men giant size one of of uh you know collecting <laughs> is a you know it's a staple it's everybody recognizes it as an amazing piece everybody wants a stormtrooper helmet there are a bunch of them, you know, similar to giant size ones in some ways. Uh, so you got to find the one that that's right for you. Um, Jedi helmets are a little different than Star, you know, the Star Wars uh, Episode Four helmets. Um, but you know, as Dave said too, this is a great one. A lot of times, the, you know, the, especially the first helmets are the paint jobs on them are all kind of messed up. That's just the way that they were. This one's yellowed a bit, but it, overall in really great condition. And, and it's 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 also interesting that it was Dave's very first prop that he bought out of Toy Shop magazine. That adds a little bit of uh, provenance to it that somebody might want. <laughs> yeah, it's just for that it, it's there if you want it. Uh, I don't think it necessarily helps, but it's there if you want it. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, very cool piece. And so yeah, it, you know, if you could have this and the store and the C three PO head, that's a fantastic instant collection. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, you may have that to choose me right. <laughs> I think you can't lose with either, frankly. So. Oh, boy. Well, uh, now in Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom uh, was a stunt leather uh, jacket. So what's the difference between, a, you know, the stunt leather jacket and the uh, the one that Harrison Ford wears? Well, there are different, I guess you could, it, it could be who wore it. Um, so this mm -hmm. was actually worn by a gentleman named Vic Armstrong. Um, and the surprise is that actually Vic should be at the event on the 11th. Um, but this is, and it's not, I'll, I'll be very also clear. This is not Vic Armstrong's jacket. He is not selling this one. This is one that he did wear and, and we were able to reunite him with the jacket uh, or will re reunite him with the jacket on the 11th. But, um, this, so, you know, Harrison Ford obviously doesn't do the stunt sequences. Those are dangerous for actors. So they have professionally trained folks. Um, Vic, I believe and Dave, you know, they may know the story better than I did on the second Indiana Jones film and Temple of Doom. I believe yeah, it's, it's a pretty famous story that Harrison Ford sort of hurt his back and hurt it badly and basically had to leave production. And they basically Spielberg sat down and figured out what he could shoot without him and basically using Vic Armstrong they shot huge parts of all of the fight sequences in the mines and him with the thuggy guards and whatnot. And then basically whatever it was five weeks later when Harrison Ford was all healed up and came in, they then were able to just kind of shoot the close-ups of Harrison, you know, kind of throwing some punches and whatnot. Um, and it's a real, uh, monument to both Spielberg's filmmaking and the incredible editing on the film. And you can see it sometimes you'll definitely see a behind shot and kind of, you can, you know, now that I'm, now that we're telling you, you can see, uh, you'll see occasionally Vic Armstrong, but it's really, it's really seamless. It's really quite something special. So obviously normally a stunt man is a part of the movie making process on Temple of Doom, it was actually, he was a larger part of the process and sort of to some extent played more of indie than is normally thought of by a stuntman just because. And Vic Armstrong was A, one of the leading stuntmen, you know, in general, you know, active in this movie, uh, the Superman movies Superman, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But also uh, in this case, you know, really, uh, you know, really 
you know, famous for being uh, Harrison Ford's stuntman on the indie movies. And like I said, in this case, just carried, played a real, a, a yeoman's load of uh, carrying the film. So this is sort of special. The jacket screen matches to a whole bunch of sequences in the film based on some of the scratches and sort of, I'll call them stains, but they're not really stains. The various leather discolorations that you see like in the collar and those are on the back as well. And so this sucker screen matches. So it's, I mean, it is all over the movie in a great way, but again, it is technically not worn by, uh, by, by Harrison, Harrison Ford, Ford. And that's what makes it a stunt. Uh, yeah, it, but yeah, and it doesn't, bo thing. doesn't bother me. <laughs> yeah, sometimes stunts, you know, we were talking, Dave and I have talked about this, like with Conan, it's like, yes, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, there are actually stunt swords and there are hero swords as well, but sometimes the quote unquote, the stunt make, make it on screen a little bit more. And as Dave said, this matches to multiple uh, sequences in the film. Uh, and I believe we actually, when we tracked down Vic, he actually had some additional photos that we were able to match it to. And I think matching in the prop world or prop and costume world is is the ultimate you know it's kind of the the 9.8 so to speak of of that is very rare that you can definitively screen mash to say that this is the one that was on screen in this particular thing because a lot of times it's fuzzy on screen and so we, right. we try to spend a lot of time at prop store trying to get those screen matches because it gives people a greater sense of, of comfort that a you're buying something authentic if you can screen match it but also for the consigner and, and also for the buyer, it's it's in some ways value, more valuable that way because it is one of the few items that you can truly say was used. And if you can find that it was used in more of the film, that usually counts for more than if it was used in one particular sequence. But just you know, knowing that it's used is is the first step. Um, and this one is definitively used, and you can see you can see the roughness of of how this jacket got beat up, uh, and it's 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 great that it did. And well, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's cool. I mean, I actually didn't know that story. So now you're going to make me go back and watch the uh, Temple of Doom and see if I can spot when Harrison Ford well, said, You'll not. definitely spot it, it, but it's pretty cool regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Spot yes. the in 80s films, finding the stunt double because, like, even Michael J. Fox had a stunt double, and you'll see that. But mm -hmm. so if you buy the jacket here, so that was from obviously the second film. This is from the third film. This is the shirt uh, that goes underneath Indy's uh, outfit to make it complete. And strangely enough, the shirts are actually in some ways rarer than the jackets. Uh, at least I think we found over time. But um, either they're unique in that they are asymmetrical. There are sort of differences on the pockets. Uh, but it has a very unique feel to it. And um, it, it is it can be its own standalone piece where... The jacket does say something, but the shirt by itself, in some ways, to also says Indy. Um, yeah, as part of his, it's part of his main costume. Um, unlike maybe the costume design that we saw earlier, that you, you is an Indy costume, but this sort of speaks to Indiana Jones. And if you and if you have a jacket and need a shirt, and you, if you have a shirt and need a jacket, this is the auction for you. Very, very nice. Did you know that I was actually, I, I made my own Indiana Jones film and I was uh, Indiana Jones? I bet you both never saw that. <laughs> I'll send you the links after the show. It, How long uh, it didn't get to LA. Didn't make yeah. it there. <laughs> was it, it did not make LA. Uh, well, You'll see. I'll send you the links later. Uh, let's see here. Well, that's cool. I mean, you know, again, it's back to, because, you know, question that I was going to have, uh, I was going to end the show with, but I'll just throw it out there now for it so that the audience can think about it. It's like, if you could own a prop from any of your favorite films, you know, as original art collectors, you know, what would that prop be? And, and you know, you can throw it in the chat, but, uh, at the same I time, it, I'd love to see what, uh, you know, people think after, you know, even after the show, put, you know, like to put a comment in after the show and just say, you know, this is, you know, the, this would be the film that if I could own anything from it would be for that film. I think Indiana Jones, the first film would probably be it for me. I mean, as far as like films that kind of blew me away as a, as a young kid, I mean, that's when, you know, you, you, you knew that the director was an important part of uh, filmmaking, at least as, as a youngster, you know, kind of from Cleveland. Uh, that's, that's when I took notice. <laughs> Yeah, I think for Indiana Jones, it's like for me, it was getting, you know, getting a whip. And that was, again, thanks to Dave. That was the one of the first things I identified that I really wanted. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for Indiana Jones, you either want a hat, a whip, a jacket or a shirt. Um, and so you got your choices. And to get all of them is the, obviously the, the dream for, for a lot of collectors. 
but uh, any of those individual items are great. They're becoming harder to get over time, at least, mm -hmm. you know, to find it. You know, you think they might be out there, but they you know, they come up, but um, you know, the prices keep going up over time as well. So. This is for you, Bill. This is uh, for you. Yeah, that is. Uh... Hey, Chuck, I, Chuck, I apologize. Can we jump? to some of my picks because yeah. i we're closing in on the two hour mark oh, i, I we are i'm gonna close. have to get out of here yeah all right yeah which one should uh, i jump we, can i can, can you jump to these are basically a couple of things that we thought i thought uh i i've sort of pulled out just to kind of show people a little perhaps maybe more off the beaten path uh lot 193 was the first one well that was the glaive so we already talked about i guess the glaive but you can show let's, it. let's show the glaive um, though if we can just uh... <laughs> Whoop, did I lose everyone for a second? Whoop. No, oh, everyone either. froze for half a second. Oh, okay. Everything froze on my screen. I apologize. I don't uh, know what the easiest catalog, way. Yeah. Just go to all catalog items, search at the bottom for lot number 197. Was it 97 or 93? 193 was the glaive, which you can we can take a look at just because we did talk about it. Um, there it is. <laughs> there she is. It's pretty Maybe. incredible. There had been a previous glaive in another auction, which was a hero in the sense that the uh, the knives, the the blades retracted. But what was interesting about it was it was only finished on one side. It was basically a specialty shot that was just done up for the up close of the blades going in and out. And what this one it just blows me away because it just it's both both sides. It really. I don't know. It just uh, I don't know. Kind of kills me in a wonderful way. And I don't know not to. Not, you know, look, I think we can make the argument any piece and a lot of the pieces in this auction are comic booky and sort of have a connection to sort of our comic book world that we like on comic, you know, here in our comic as comic art collectors. But this one, yeah. I think, just really is special. Um, if you go back to the uh, the master list, uh, I know we had already talked about the Mobius piece, but uh, oh, and I guess we did the Harry Lang as well. Oh, look at that. We did more than I thought. Go to lot 31. This was another one that I just loved. And I think a lot of uh, uh, a lot of comic fans will as well. This is a very simple little piece. It's a Jack Nicholson autographed Joker glove for the for, from the first movie. Um, it's a purple glove. Uh, so, you know, it could only belong, I guess, to the Joker or to Prince. But uh it's too big for Prince. He has much teeny tinier little hands. So it has to be Nicholson as the Joker. Uh, I love that costume. I love that original iteration. Uh, I love, uh, you know, I, I'd love to have a full ensemble of the Joker, but to be able to grab something like this and the signature from Nicholson, I think that's just sort of something special. And uh, yeah, just, you know, real comic booky. And definitely as I start to collect, as I've been collecting props, the overlap of the Venn diagram, if you will, of sort of comics and movies is a lot of the superhero movies. And that's the Michael Keaton, Batman for me, the Christopher Reeve, Superman, Th those are some of the biggies, you know, so this one fits right into that wheelhouse. Um, so worth checking out. And then another one that I pulled out that I just got a real kick out of and certainly might be bidding on myself is lot 44. There you go. Look at that, which is the sandworm from Beetlejuice. And one of the things that I love about this is, again, you know, we were talking earlier about sketchbooks and notebooks and stuff. And this is very much right out of Tim Burton's sketchbooks. I mean, this is his drawings, if you've ever seen any of the Tim Burton art stuff, brought to life in a really wonderful way. And I just love that. I love, I mean, we can get into director auteur theory and all of that kind of stuff. But just on a pure art basis, this is crazy art brought to life and i just get a real kick out of that so those were just a couple of the pieces that i sort of wanted to sort of sub highlight if you will uh things that i thought some of the uh uh the comic art collectors that might be tuning in tonight might uh, get an extra kick out of added a whole bunch of different price points also uh bigger items smaller items the, the glove and whatnot so i thought people would get a kick out of that but uh I just wanted to show that off before I ran away. I do apologize. It's a school night and I've, I've got my, I've got children's homework to help with. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you could make it, Dave. This was a lot of fun getting to hang out with you. No, oh, uh, very enjoyable. Chuck will take you all home. Uh, if you guys are interested in more prop talk, I co-host a podcast with Ryan Condal, the showrunner of House of the Dragon, called The Stuff Dreams Are Made Of. Uh, you can check it out uh, on your prop, prop, ugh, prop 
podcast network uh and on our youtube channel which is also under the stuff dreams are made of uh, i was popping into prop store and you can see me kind of holding and looking and talking about some of these props some some of them that we've talked about tonight but also a whole bunch that we did so check all that out as well uh and dave on wednesday you guys do your own uh sort of I guess your favorites of things that are in the yes world. this Wednesday we're kind of doing our favorite things and we'll follow that up next Sunday with a, a live YouTube broadcast where we'll sort of answer questions and go through the, the catalog again with you if you are interested uh, but on What's that, that uh, most of those shows start Dave uh, the podcast is just a podcast the live yeah. broadcast is going to be 11 uh, sorry I think it's oh I can't remember now because there's something weird with the British time change I think it's 11, but it might, I think it's 11, but it also might be 12 noon. There'll be, there'll be something on the weird. website somewhere. There's something weird okay. where America has, uh, America changes time and UK doesn't for a couple of weeks. And it really F's everything up in terms of live broadcasts. So we will figure out a time and it will be there. So check that all out. Take them on home, Chuck, but I'm going to run away. Okay. Thanks, Dave. We appreciate your right. uh, insight. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Good night, Dave. All right. Okay. So, Bill, yeah, I mean, I, I, we don't, we can we quickly go over some of that. I had some superhero related stuff in there. Yeah. Sort of quickly talk to and it. The, you can see some of it in the, the back. Warhammer there. getting us started here. We do. And we, we can sort of quickly go through these. But again, think people that are comic book lovers, comic art lovers, these are things that might appeal to you, especially if you're a Thor lover, like, like uh, Bill is there. Um, this is from Thor 1. Um, Thor 1 hammers are a little bit more scarce than uh, Thor 2 hammers, although this is the second version that we've had of this. Um, this is a slightly different version than the one we've ha had previously. That one had a soft, sort of squishy uh, sort of top to it that was used if Casey Day hits things. This one's more of a hollow one that you know Chris Hemsworth would have uh, used and, and carried around with him, maybe on his belt or just you know carried in his hands. Still lightweight, you know, a pound versus the five pound version that is the, the quote unquote hero versions of a, a Thor hammer. And the Thor one hammer was a shorter handle, um, didn't have the end cap at the end. Um, you know, slightly different design after they, they changed it in Thor 2 and continued to evolve it after that, mm -hmm. of course, before it got cracked. So, but great piece, you know, if you can get a Thor hammer, Thor hammer, a Thor 1 hammer is great to get. Uh, X-Men fans, this is Wolverine or Hugh Jackman's uh, jacket and shirt from the very first X-Men movie in 2000. Uh, comes with a Fox certificate of authenticity uh, back when Fox was doing auctions. Um and I think it's great, you know, as far as I love that first one, um, you know, I, I've always thought about getting one of these myself, uh, and this is a great example to have it. It's got nice, similar to the Indiana Jones jacket, it's got some damage on the back, but I think that was intentional for the movie when he gets thrown through the the uh, truck um, through by Sabretooth. Uh, and, you know, intentionally distressed, like the patch or the uh, the stripe on the, 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 the side there is missing, but that's something from the film. Uh, but, uh, you know, great to see these up close because you know that they are sort of handmade. The leather straps or the, the you know, the, the, the detailing on the sides all hand done on it. You can sort of see that up and up close and personal. And there's the sort of the, the damage to the back of the coat. Uh, but be great. And it would pair really nicely if you had a pair of claws, if you've got some Wolverine artwork, you know, whether it's ones you bought in our auction or stuff that you already got in your collection. Uh, it would be great to have a Wolverine collection that includes you know, this jacket. Personally, I think this was more realistic, you know, reminded me of the 1980s brown and tan costume that he had, although they turned it into a, a leather jacket. Um, I always pick, I picked up on the vibe here. I was like, why does this seem so right? And then I sort of look back at like X-Men 141, you know, he's wearing a leather jacket on that. That's days of future past, right? He's, he's not in a Wolverine costume. He's dressed more like this. And so I think we, you know, that's, that's part of the reason when they actually introduced him as Wolverine, this, this felt even more right than just being Hugh Jackman and being a good actor uh, that was in those shoes. So, um, yeah, love the love that jacket. And they, they had variations of this jacket in later movies, but I think this first one was the best one. Um, at least my opinion on that. So here's here's your opportunity to get one with the Fox COA. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy fans, this is a, a hero rifle or excuse me, a, a hero blaster from Star Lord. Um, what's cool about this is that it is made out of it, it's got sort of that machined aluminum aspects of this as opposed to a static resin version of this. So it feels like a real gun. Um, it is, 
you, you think about like artwork, the you, you see where it looks like it has it sort of been heated on the tip. Well, that's all airbrushing that is done to the prop to make it look like it was fired at one point and got really hot. Um, and that is a special art that they have to apply to this. And uh, it you know feels like a real gun. Um, it, the grips are are custom made on that. In that there's a right hand and a left hand um, version of it that only fit in the right or left hand version, uh, your right or your left hand. Um, and this is a great one because it was taken, I believe, to 2013 uh, Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con. They put it on display there as the movie was filming and then people took pictures of it. And that's how we were able to screen match this particular blaster back to pictures that fans had taken, you know, of the Marvel display that had been going on. And then it went back onto set and ultimately landed in this auction years and years later, but very cool. You don't get to see hero blasters like this very often. Um, and you know, it was that first guardians movie, a great film. No argument for me on that one. Then you get, yeah. uh, Gimli's yeah, this is axe. This is cool. Gimli's axe. Yeah, the story on these is that um, not much of this is out there. Um, in in that, um, you know, this stuff was made by Weta, and you'll see um, you see in the up close things that there's actually a, a bug that is a Weta bug. If you went to if you've gone to New Zealand, you you maybe have done a tour of the Weta Studios, but they made all the things for Lord Lord of the Rings. Um, but you know, most of this stuff is being held. But they did allow a few pieces to be, uh, I guess, given away as giveaways. Um, they had actually given this to Sideshow Collectibles so that they could make replicas of the toys. Um, and so this was a reference piece and then ultimately was uh, raffled off and given away. And that's how it entered into the collector's hands. It is actually it's got writing on it talking about the history of the piece. You can sort of see that down there. And like I said, it's got the Weta bug and it's got the, the Weta um annotations and the numbering on it uh, but but very cool and recognizable piece from lord of the rings and then we've got things again back to the future is one of those movies that i said i had to get something from uh, i do like i said i have a hoverboard which i think is a, is a great piece um but um the guitars are also a memorable part of the movie so this is from the very first scene where we see marty at the uh, at the beginning of the very first Back to the Future film, and I I likened it to the Memorex ads that you used to see in the old Rolling Stones, where he blows out, you know, he's kind of sitting there and he's getting blown back by the speaker. This is where he he hooks this tiny little guitar, and when you see it in person, it is tiny. Uh, and I'll actually grab it over here. Let me put my glove on here, and uh, I will. Is it going to look like a ukulele? It, yeah. it, you know, it is. It's called a Chiquita guitar, and it's and it's. Uh, what they call a travel guitar, but it's um, you kind of see it here, but it, it's pretty small. This does not look like that, but I think Michael J. Fox being so small, it probably looks big. If you go back and watch the, the movie, it actually probably looks bigger in comparison to him. But to a guy like me, this looks like a, almost like a ukulele or something along those lines. But great piece. Um, from what we understand, it's the only one. There's actually a marking on here that came from the, uh, the uh, prop master. So it was part of, of a piece that the prop master provided to the production. Um, but hard to find something like this from a key movie like Back to the Future, um, especially a, a one of one. Um, you're not going to find it. And the other guitars from the, uh, you know, the Johnny B. Good sequence, uh, are, right. they've been out there. But from what I understand, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. So those are very beloved. And this is the first time this has ever come to public auction. So, so hopefully this will a, a mega... Back to the Future fan will end up with this great piece. And along those lines, you got the plutonium uh, cell and canister. And what's cool about this is that it's the, what they call the hero version. This, uh, the, the bottom part of this, uh, I guess, unscrews or it, it, it moves around and then it, the canister or the um, plutonium actually drops into the, uh, as you can see it there, it drops into the DeLorean. So this is that, that one from that scene. Um, there are other versions of this out there, uh, but you know, always people always look for sort of the best example, and this is the best example that you're going to find from that sequence. And before they switched it to you know the DeLorean taking garbage and uh, turning that into energy in the second movie here, this is high grade plutonium from terrorists. <laughs> exactly, and it's got some bids already. Yeah, it's a rare, and you know, never seen, especially the Hero one. First time it's it's come to market as well, so. Um, Anytime something like that happens, you 
got some fans that want it. And speaking of first time, as it comes to market, we, this is something that every time we do this, we just don't know what actually exists out there. And we were shocked to find this. So as I mentioned earlier, Blade Runner, really hard to find things from. Um, this is a they, what they call the lobster spinner. And so you actually see this at the beginning of the film. I think it's the first spinner that you actually see. Uh, and they, they actually repainted this one yellow or from yellow to this color uh, later on through the movie. So they reused it. But um, this was, as you can see, that it, it's signed. It was actually given away after the movie uh, was done. And it comes with, these are the original cards that it came with. And it's it's got Harrison Ford's full signature. You don't see him signing like that. It's a little it's faded at this point in time, but you see that where it says starring, that is actually Harrison Ford's signature there. And then there's a um, a description of you know of the piece. And I don't know if you want to zoom in on that, but it, it just talks about the creation of this. And it was really cool. We um, the gentleman that created this, uh, we we he he lives here in Los Angeles. Came in the other day and had reunited with this piece. You know, since 1982, we hadn't seen this piece. Nobody in the Bla in the Blade Runner collecting community knew that this piece still existed. They always wondered uh, where it was. And, you know, it's been preserved uh, because it was given away to somebody back in 1982 and has been in their collection and now coming to auction. So much, much more reasonable than a full size spinner, which they have one uh, full size spinner. You can see a different different type of spinner, but that's over at the Mopop Museum. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. But very cool. Yeah. I mean, these model miniatures are pretty fantastic. Um, just the detail that they do, they put into these things. So if you're a Blade Runner fan, this is kind of the ultimate piece or one of the ultimate pieces. And we, we've been lucky. We've had, uh, you know, we've had some some coats and uh, other pieces from Blade Runner that we just never thought still existed. And it's, it's great every year when we discover something new. And this is one of our latest finds. Hey, I know we, uh, look at yeah, let's, piece. let's, I apologize, but I know we're a little late here, but maybe we can, um, I don't know if we can skip to the end here. You want to look at, uh, we got some X-Files. Mm, we got uh, some X-Files. Yep. Those are great. Yeah. One of those my favorite TV shows of all time. Wonderful. This is, uh, th yeah, I wanted to touch on the the vintage stuff that we have. I think which um, right. people that have participated in prop stores auctions before, we haven't necessarily had as many vintage pieces. And I think this auction is special. Um, this, <laughs> I know everybody thinks of Captain America, but, uh, this is from the counterculture film uh, Easy Rider. This is Peter Fonda's motorcycle. This was originally what they call the crash motorcycle. It crashes in the film. Um, it was rebuilt. So this is it, it, it's it is restored, you know, fully restored. So it doesn't necessarily look like it, it did on screen. Um, but it uh, it is it's signed uh, on the gas tank by Peter Fonda as well after it was restored and comes with uh, sort of the provenance behind it. Um, but a you know very important piece of film history uh, from the 1960s. And if you're a motorcycle fan, obviously also very important. So we'll be bringing this out to the Peterson. It's nice to be able to bring motorcycles like this. We'll also have an Evil Knievel motorcycle. We'll have a Blade motorcycle. We'll have one from Terminator. Uh, which one is it? Salvation, I believe, that we'll have the Moto Terminator. So we've got a lot of great motorcycles in this, but this is really that one of the highlight pieces in here. And then um, in a slightly different way, we've, we've got some great costume pieces from vintage Hollywood as well. Um, this is uh, Audrey Hepburn's Sabrina dress. Uh, this was uh, Edith Head and Givenchy had created this dress. Uh, it's just fabulous to see in person. May, you know, we, we were lucky enough to sell Princess Leia's dress last year. Uh, or to offer it, excuse me, and it, didn't, and it ultimately did not sell. Uh, but this is just a, you know, this is sort of up there with, um, you know, sort of like a Marilyn Monroe dress. And to see this in person is just a fantastic, you know, I'm not necessarily a costume person, but this one sort of moved me just to see classic Hollywood in person on this. Um, but we've got other great pieces from classic Hollywood, like from, we've got Sandy's uh, outfit from Greece. We've got Groucho Marx's glasses. We've got, um, we've got uh, Charlie Chaplin's, uh, white um, jacket from um, uh, The Great Dictator. We've got uh, De Niro's jacket from Godfather 2. So just a lot of great vintage Hollywood in this, if you're a fan of that. Um, I, I didn't want to spend a ton of time on that, given that I know this is more of a comic art, art audience. Uh, but proud to you know be able to bring these things to market and you know offer to collectors, because I think all of us are touched by film. And if you're a film historian, these are all important pieces. So. No, absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, well, I can tell you that, you know, when we think about future OEX, uh, uh, you know, opportunities out there, you know, we, we're going to be moving into <laughs> illustration and, uh, 
props could have a spot of some some level. I mean, it's art at the end of the day, especially when it, you look it at is. Stuff. It's it, and that's the thing yeah, I realize. Yeah. It's three D art, right? Three runner piece. I mean, yeah, it's uh, and well, and, and even just looking at the film art. I mean, that's that's more illustration. But the thing is, is that the props are that too. I mean, we you know we're definitely looking at many different areas, uh, sculpture as well. So there's uh, so yeah, it, it has a place. I mean, there's crossover. So I'm number one Marvel fan. Uh, uh, Tom's talking about it, uh, you know, being a collector at numerous times in the uh, in the chat. So there's a, there is a fair amount of crossover from the people who collect props and uh, those who collect original art. I mean, it's all art at the end of the day, by and large. Uh, it is, and I think it's all this. It's around the stuff that we love, and I think it's you know, in our world, it's it's all entertainment in some ways, and I think it focuses even more today around all the properties that we love and the reasons we get into it, and. You know, I've, I've learned to appreciate it similar. Like I've had relationships with a lot of the comic artists over the years. And it's been great to, to know people like Mike Bosberg. But Mike, you know, not only worked, you know, as uh, on She-Hulk and G.I. Joe, but he also mm -hmm. worked on um, the, the Narnia movies. And, you know, he actually uh, did the an Beatles, end, right? And he did Tales from yeah. the Crypt. And, yeah. you know, so he had a sort of a second life in this world of film and television that I could explore, you know, sort of through this love as well. And it's, it's been a great bridge. And I always appreciate having sort of a physical, you know, let's say there's anything wrong with comic books too. I think it's nice to have a comic book next to your comic art. Uh, I think it's great to have a movie prop next to, to some of that. And sometimes, you know, they don't always have an equivalent, you know, you don't always have like for, if you like Audrey Hepburn, there's not necessarily a, a comic book adaptation of, of, of Sabrina, but mm -hmm. uh, there's Sabrina, the teenage wish, I guess, but that's not quite the same thing. Um, yeah, no, not quite. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a cool way of collecting to to get into it. And I would suggest anybody that's interested, if you know, hopefully we've given you a flavor for what's in the auction. Go to propstore.com, take a look at the catalog. There's different ways of searching. There's a PDF version of the catalog. But I am more than happy, and I will say, just being um, you know somebody that was converted or you know was was brought into this world of you know, expanding my horizons and looking at the world of entertainment collectibles more broadly than just sort of comic art, which is where I started. Um, I'd be happy to spend the time with, with any of you guys out there. And I, I hope people come out to the event uh, that can come out to the event. Um, I think somebody mentioned they're on the wait list. Yes, you can still, there is still a wait list. And I think we, we still will probably hopefully be opening up a few more spots for the event on, on the 11th. So if you're in Los Angeles, if you can be in Los Angeles, or I would say reach out to me personally at chuck at propstore.com and I'll I don't know if you want to put that somewhere, Bill, but Chuck at PropStore.com. You're more than welcome to reach out to me if you guys want to come. Uh, I'm more than happy to try to get folks into the uh, the event that we're hosting on the 11th. And, you know, frankly, just share what I've learned and what I continue to learn about this hobby. Um, and hopefully we'll also continue to offer more great art offerings. Um, we're, we're looking for things. And, uh, you know, even as consigners or people that are considering consigning and where do you put your stuff in today's world, Maybe what you've also taken away from watching today is that, you know, it's nice to have things like X-Men pages in the middle of, of having it next to Wolverine's jacket and claws. And what we find is that it's a it's a great way of exposing new people to the world of comic art and the fact that these are really complementary things. I think it's ama amazing that we can showcase David Mack's artwork, you know, alongside Captain America and Thor props and other things like that that we have in the auction. So um, I like to intermix a lot of that stuff. Um in my in my mind, it's all sort of one big blur. But I do mm -hmm. think, for, from a consignment standpoint, hopefully, also seeing you know, not, you know, some of those X Men pages that we showed today may just get lost in other auction houses. And I think what we try to do is put a focus on every piece and say, why is this one special? You know, why did we bring it into the auction? And we really, I try to personally curate these things and put them in there for a reason and try to you know try to. You know, let's say I, I'm going to go out and buy these pieces myself, but it, I have to I, I like to take an interest in it myself and say, I, I really like this piece. I like that Marvel team up page because it has an early Wolverine and it has an early Jean Grey on it. I remember right. writing that too. And I want to provide X-Men art that's affordable in today's world where everything is over ten thousand dollars. It's from that time frame. So hopefully you know, it goes for a little less. Um, but nope. hopefully you guys, again, like what you saw, take a look, go to propstore.com, look at the catalog. The auction's coming up March 12th through the 14th. You can bid now at any time. You can bid in advance. Um, and just like in most of the other places, your your top bid won't be, um, you know, won't be shown until uh, somebody else bids against you. Or if, if the item hasn't met reserve, then it'll it'll go up to the reserve. So all days are open to bid now. Even the, 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 yeah. Full catalog's online. You can bid now. 
or you can wait to that sign up for phone bidding um, or you can join online the day of the auction and, and bid away against uh, against the auctioneer and hopefully you enjoy the interface i know a lot of people have opinions about what are good and not so good auction platforms i think most people would put us in the good category so thank you to all those and if there are things that we can continue to do to improve we're always open to feedback and always trying to make our auctions better uh, and as i mentioned earlier you know we're adding the, the the no reserve day partly as response to when we did a survey that's you know people were like everything's getting to be too expensive can you can you put some other things in there that that other people like myself can afford and so mm -hmm. we, we sort of uh, we you know we try our best you know we can't control at the end of the day we can't control the prices because it's an auction but we can try our best to at least give a, a wide variety and selection of things. And I think there's over 580 films and television shows represented in this auction. So, you know, if you if you like the obscure things like Crawl, you know, there's a lot of great pieces in, from Crawl in this one. But it's very rare that we do have great Crawl pieces. So it's it's good. But, you know, there might be, you know, Sabrina. Can't say we, we've ever really had anything from Sabrina before. Um, Greece is a tough one to find things from. Godfather 2 is a, is a very tough thing to find. But um, yeah, it's great to, I, you know, it's fun. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to, to bring this to everybody out there. And thanks for joining us for, I know it's, uh, it's now been over two hours. So thanks for sticking with us. It's not a record for us, but it's a, yeah, this is a good point. But I will say, I, I, I do appreciate the fact that you have Comic Art in, the, uh, in your auctions as well. I mean, I think that uh, finding ways to expose new, uh, new potential collectors to the hobby is always a good thing. I think you know having more people in the pool, uh, you know, seeing, you know, enjoying the art is, uh, you know, is definitely something that uh, you know we've always strived to tr try to do as well. And it's not an easy thing to do, but uh, auctions certainly have that. You know, you you have the ability to because you have eye, you have collector eyeballs on other things, and I think that's uh, that's really important. I'm glad that Prop Store is is doing that. It's wonderful. Yeah, and I, I, I see. Thank you, number one Marvel fan, uh, for reminding me around payment plans. I think one thing, just uh, as far as differences between other auction houses, one thing that is different about Prop Store is we do have a three-month interest-free payment plan, which mm -hmm. means you don't have to, you know, that you put, uh, you put a, a, I forget exactly. I think it's forty percent down, but then you pay it off, and we don't charge interest though as you pay it off, and you can use your credit card up to twenty-five thousand. Um, which a lot of places don't allow you to do the first 5,000 of that. There's no charge. And then there's a 2% fee after that. Um, but I think we try to make it as affordable. I know there's other auction houses that require payment right away. And I think we're also looking, if you've got consignments, if you've got things you want to do, talk to us about, you know, would we take these and put them in a future auction to help you pay down um, your purchases? More than happy to talk about those types of options as well. So Fantastic. Bill, you're getting a compliment on your haircut. I know. I just, that's why I was trying to text Josh and say, tell Sherry, thank you. Uh, Cause yeah, my wife hates it. She's like, you're going back to get another haircut uh, in the next uh, week or so. So I yeah, can't, can't keep everybody happy, but, um, but yeah, as everybody saw, Chuck at propstore.com is the email address. If you've got yep. any questions about this auction or future auctions, payment plans, you know, how the bidding process works, you know, feel free to reach out to Chuck. He's, you know, Chuck, you know, we've known each other since I've been in the hobby and Chuck's always been incredibly uh, gracious with his time. So uh, I'm sure if, you, if uh, you've got a question, he is very happy to help you out. Yeah, I, I look at myself as, I mean, yes, I do this full time, but I am really a collector that I would say lucked into doing this full time, but I still consider myself a collector like everybody else out there. And it's mm -hmm. always for all of us, it's a learning experience. And I think the the best thing we can do is help each other by sharing what we've learned um, and especially in auctions like this. So, you know, I get that question all the time of like, Hey, I, I like props. How do I get started? What should I avoid? You know, what should I, what should I consider? What's a good, you know, what's a good solid investment? You know, if, I, if I'm worried about it. happy to give all those opinions. Um, but as Dave also said, I think it starts with, you know, start with buying what you like because ultimately this is all about, you know, connecting with things that, you know, whether it was a comic book that you read or a movie, it's all about collecting things that bring you back to good memories. And that's why you have this stuff. Um, yeah, that's it. Fantastic. That's a good point to end it on. Um, Chuck, thank end. you as always. Uh, you know, I'm here to send, so I, I think I probably need to send out a few emails for you too. So let's, let's make sure we take care of that before the auction, uh, you know, gets, yeah. uh, gets started. Maybe and thank you to all you guys for staying with us and all your com comments on the sides and questions. Mm -hmm. um, we really appreciate you guys doing that. And uh, thanks to Dave, even though he's not here.
but uh, thanks for staying He's up. He's got homework to do with the kids. He's got homework. It's it's really <laughs> tough. He's trying to get an A. He really is. Oh, man. All right, everybody. Well, thank you again for tuning in. We appreciate it, and uh, have a wonderful night, and we'll see you again.